Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story involving screaming in front of an entire crowd. But first a story from Port Au Prince. During World War II, when the Germans took over France, the French government had the elevators on the Eiffel Tower destroyed. So if their leader wanted to plant a flag on top of the tower, he'd have to take the stairs to the top. The Eiffel Tower was built in 1889 as a centerpiece for the 1889 World's Fair. It took two years to build this magnificent structure, which played an important role in history. Following the German invasion of Poland, France declared war on Germany in 1939. However, it only took six weeks beginning on May 10, 1940 for Germany to defeat France. Germany took over Paris, but the French resistance fighters, on the arrival of the Germans, decided to destroy the cables of the elevator so it would be impossible for their leader and the army to climb the 324 meter tall tower with ease. I think it's great what they did in an effort to try to stop some defacement of a huge landmark. Would you guys say that what these soldiers did was for the greater good, or simply just a small but positive type thing? Would it have looked horrendous for Paris to get immediately captured and a flag hoisted right away at the top of the Eiffel Tower? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Anon Meowish. Going to obsessively stare at me from your car? Big mistake, pal. So I drive my wife to a clothing store, and while she's shopping, I wait in the car. About 10 minutes later, I notice a guy is staring at me from another car. Not a glance, a full stare. So I do the thing I normally do when idiots stare. I wave back to them. He waves back. Then I start blowing him kisses. And he still stares. Now, we're outside a women's clothing store, so I know there's a good chance his girlfriend or wife will be going back to their car. So I wait and wait, staring at him the entire time. This guy was weird. I wait until his girlfriend or wife gets inside the car. His windows are open, by the way. I go up to his car, point directly at him and say very loudly, I'm flattered, but I am not gay. Then I slowly turn around, walk back to my car, and continue waiting for my wife. If you're waiting for your partner, and there's people like right outside the entrance to the store, is it weird to keep looking in the direction of the store, and thereby kind of looking directly at these people? Or is it fair game for these people because they're literally standing right in front of the entrance? I'd like to know your guys' thoughts on this too. Our next story is from Uncle Bug Music, Six String Justice. 30 years ago, a music store co-worker named Jake and I started hanging out after work. We always had a great time, lots of laughs, and I thought he'd be the perfect fit in my band as a lead guitar player. He was. The other band members liked him and we all hit it off. We played a few gigs and finally got into this new place who would only hire 4-5 to five piece bands. And as a previous 3 piece, we couldn't get booked without our new addition. The owner just thought 3 piece bands sounded cheap and empty, his words. The place wasn't the best bar or anything, but they paid well, and it was another place to play and add to our regular gig rotation. The night of the gig came, and Jake wasn't there to help load in or set up. We started at 9.30, and still no Jake, but we had to play. The manager was on me immediately at our first break, figuring we lied to him about being a four-piece band. He was really pissed. I'm not gonna fire you, but you'll never play here again for pulling this BS. There was nothing I could do to convince him we hadn't planned it. We didn't have cell phones, 1989, so we literally had no clue where this guy was. And to be honest, I was getting pretty worried about my friend, as this was not like him at all. Finally, after two sets, Jake shows up at 11.15pm alive and well. He confided in us that he was banging some girl he met and that she took precedence over the gig. The guys were furious. The bar manager realized we were telling the truth about being a four-piece, but told us we would never play there again due to the unprofessionalism of our band, one guy. After the gig, the two other members told me to fire Jake. I was pissed off too, but because I did like this guy, I tried to convince the others to give him another chance. They wouldn't budge. So I told my friend at work on the following Monday. He didn't have much to do with me after that and was quite bitter about it. I felt bad even though it was his fault, but just did my job and he did his, and we stopped hanging out. That sucked because we really hit it off and I missed my friend. A couple months later, I get called into the boss's office and told that he's received tons of complaints of me not working, possibly stealing, and that he was letting me go immediately. I was stunned. I was very well liked and was great at my job. 
I was totally blindsided, but one thing my boss hinted was that it was Jake who had reported these things about me. Jake was also in very good standing with the boss. I told him none of it was true, explained the previous band situation as a possible motive, but it didn't matter. I was fired. Two weeks later, I received a call to come back to work. Apparently, everyone in the store went to my boss to tell him he fired the wrong person, and it was Jake who should have been fired, not only for lying about me, but how his behavior was terrible. I went back in and accepted a new position, where I learned inexplicably that Jake wasn't fired, but I was given the job he wanted. I wouldn't have to work with him in the store. I did the new job for 10 months and decided to go back to school in September, but there were still two months. I'd mentioned it to the store manager and Jake must have overheard it. The next day, my boss fired me again because Jake had once again made accusations that I hated the job and clients. Man, this guy was not satisfied with getting me fired just once. This time I just went, ah, screw it, and left. Sometimes the bad guys win when it comes to petty revenge. Life lesson learned. Well, not only was the friend here a grade A jerk, but very clearly the boss was equally a grade A jerk, and Jake was up to their elbow seemingly puppeteering this boss. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every single video has awesome stories, like our next one from I Am Hurting Cats. I'm a team builder. A few years ago, I was sitting in a job interview and the hiring manager asked, what do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? This gave me pause as I've been doing the same thing for over 25 years. I let the mists of memory transport me back in time. Dorian is the nurse manager, Kip is the program manager, Dr. Steve is the clinical director. Yes, I had three bosses. I started on the unit as an already seasoned, jaded, RN, and soon discovered that most staff who worked there were very, very young and inexperienced. For many, this was their first real job. They assumed all the weird stuff that happened every day was just normal for the workplace. Dorian had decreed that no one was allowed to write incident reports for med errors or safety issues because it makes me look bad in the safety huddle. Non-clinical staff allowed to pass meds, schedule changes without notice. Additionally, the department was easily the most toxic I've ever worked in, with various cliques at constant war with one another. I could go on and on. The troubles began one day when I opened my email to a message from Dorian which stated a very curtly that I was being investigated for an incident which had happened on the unit, that I was to meet with HR to discuss it and for possible disciplinary action. I was not to discuss the incident with anyone. No date was given, no medical record number, no indication what the issue could be. I replied that I would need the above information, would speak with my union rep, and meet at a time convenient for me. Dorian declined to give information. I declined to meet with him. I began receiving emails almost daily, each more threatening than the last. I printed them all, contacted my sister, the employment attorney, tried not to start shaking whenever I had to check my email. I was keenly aware that this is Intimidation 101, but it is remarkably effective even when you know that. Because I'm not a direction follower, I was soon discussing this in the break room and before I knew it had been approached by three other women who had all received the same email on the same day. Comparison showed the emails being sent out about a minute apart. We didn't work the same shifts nor the same days. We agreed to call into the union rep and refused to meet with HR. Dorian continued to escalate, including cornering us in the hall, stepping in chest to chest and trying to stare us down. He was a very big guy. Before long, we were speaking to more and more women, and it came to light that Dorian had a habit of targeting them with this exact email, followed by others that were more and more threatening until the person would finally meet with HR, get written up for something vague, and then be forced to sign a non-disclosure slash no retaliation agreement. It seemed that he had simply picked the wrong four women this time because we were not having it. I can't tell you how much time at work began to be spent with people crying while recounting their stories. None had thought to call in the union rep. They didn't even know their Weingarten rights. We began to plot. We had limited time, and our company has a long and unglamorous history of protecting people like this. Before long, the entire team was united against the common enemy. LGBTQ staff wrote up statements, backed with witnesses, 
of grossly homophobic comments, often in the presence of patients. Staff who were immigrants made statements about racial slurs. A staff who was incredibly petty and vindictive had been compiling a dossier on every perceived policy violation and wrongdoing on Dorian's part since his hiring date, and he prepped it for presentation to HR. The graveyard shift, all huge men, said, obviously Dorian isn't trying to flex on us, but we want to help. So they spent a couple nights cruising Dorian's social media posts and capturing screenshots of homo, trans, xenophobic, and misogynistic comments. Worried that they hadn't done enough, the night staff paid for a cheap background check, and what a score! DUI, failure to appear, hit and run, domestic violence, assault with a deadly weapon. Did the company not do a background check? What the freak? Finally, two women came forward with complaints of sexual harassment. One incident had even occurred in the presence of the assistant manager, and one was documented in an email. We were ready. We flooded HR with meeting requests, and our union rep coordinated the assault so that on Monday, we met for simple harassment and intimidation. I met first, and HR seemed unimpressed by my complaint. Tuesday, all LGBTQ and staff subjected to racial slurs made their formal complaints. They said that the HR lady looked tired. Wednesday started with the background check, moved into the minutia of policy violation, and culminated with well-documented quid pro quo sexual harassment. The union rep informed HR that the union's attorney was eager to know how to proceed. HR assured her that that would not be necessary. That evening, Dorian posted a sign on his office door saying he would be away for a few days, and to contact Kip or Dr. Steve if we needed anything. Graveyard Shift reported that over the weekend, housekeeping came and removed everything from his office except his name tag, which the night staff took as a trophy. On Monday at Shift Change, the CNO, COO, and HR met with the team and informed us that effective immediately, Dorian was no longer employed by the hospital. We all sat silently and politely until they exited the unit, when a loud and spontaneous cheer went up. People were hugging each other and cry laughing, high fives all around. In the aftermath, to the best of my knowledge, Dorian never worked as an RN again. Frankly, I don't care. Kip was fired three days later for having been aware of all that was going on and turning a blind eye, and because apparently he'd been touching women on the unit for a couple years. I hadn't been aware of that, but it came out in the HR meetings. Dr. Steve was also fired for sexual harassment. The unit hired an old manager of mine who had a long and well-documented history of, you guessed it, sexual harassment. I quit within days of him being offered the job. The department's foray into getting along crumbled. Most of the staff had moved on to other jobs where they seemed much happier. What do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? I sat up straight, smiled and said, I took a very fractured team and brought them together to achieve a common goal. I like to think I'm really good at team building. This honestly is a really good team building story. I think the only thing that just blatantly sucks here, which I think most of us can agree upon, is that nothing really was actually resolved in the end. They finally compiled enough evidence that the hospital could not ignore, and then they immediately and swiftly replaced them with the next man up on the horrible persons list. It's like a clear-cut case of you won the battle but not the war. You finally got the first one fired and it's like, alright, next harasser, step on up. And you go through three of them and they still hire more. Our next story is from Storyteller Eclipse. I hid from my boss. So this story took place at my first job at the Shining Golden Arches. I had a boss roughly four feet tall and acted like everyone was stupid except her. Her and I didn't get along, but since I got along with other supervisors, it didn't bug me that much. Until she started pulling this stunt, where she would ask me to stay past my 8 hour shift to get overtime. Overtime pay only gets applied if you work 30 minutes or more past an 8 hour shift. That tiny, bitter princess would force me to clock out at 25 to 28 minutes after, squeezing as much time out of me as she could without actually paying me for it. Supervisors sometimes got in trouble if they gave out too much overtime, so I could understand her trying to get help at the end of the night without getting in trouble, but then I realized she wasn't doing this to anybody else, just me. That made it personal. Coupled with the fact that she always had the worst attitude with me, it was clear she was just doing it to spite me. 
She was sweet with other people, but was always bitter towards me. Had me do the worst jobs, even forgot about my breaks from time to time, and never apologized for any of it. I decided I was going to push back. At first, I tried to be civil and ask her why I needed to clock out that very second. When she explained that she would get in trouble if I stayed too long, I asked why she let other people stay, to which she told me to stop talking back to her and just clock out already. She used her power as a supervisor to threaten an insubordination claim. If she was going to play dirty, then so was I. You see, fellow people of the internet, I might have been taller and heavier than my manager, but I could compact myself. I specialized in cleaning during closing time and would bend and squeeze my feminine body into the tightest of spaces to get the stains my OCD mind wouldn't let me leave behind. When my supervisor asked me to stay when it was time to clock out, I decided to enact my revenge. Very simply, I squeezed into a space that she would not find me underneath one of the machines. There was a lot of grime back there, so I managed to spend half an hour hiding from my pint-sized supervisor. I remember her calling my name, but I pretended not to hear and kept scrubbing away. At 31 minutes past my 8-hour shift, I finally revealed myself and stepped out from underneath the machine. My supervisor immediately saw and ran out to berate me from a foot below my eye level. How dare I clean out of her sight? Now she was going to get in trouble because she handed out too much overtime. I feigned ignorance and let her rant on while I watched the clock tick up an extra 5 minutes. Eventually her chihuahua tantrum calmed down and she told me to just clock out with a look of defeat. She never asked me to stay over my scheduled time ever again and avoided talking to me until the day I was due my final paycheck. She was obligated to tell me it was ready since she was the only supervisor on shift. I never saw her again after that. I'm sorry, but is it even legal in most places to work 30 minutes past your 8 hour shift and not get paid overtime until only after half an hour? If I worked like 10 minutes of overtime, I'd want overtime pay for that. So having them work 25 to 28 minutes and then sign out just before half an hour? That alone is insane to me. There's something in general with this business going on that's just totally wrong with that. Our next story is from Estefania. My neighbor has openly expressed his anti-LGBTQ plus views to other people in the neighborhood. My neighbor across the street is one of the biggest passive-aggressive people I have ever met. One time when I was cleaning my yard, he made a comment about how the previous owner, Owner 1, kept the lawn pristine and that we should look into keeping it that way. He then proceeded to say that the person who owned it before the last owner, Owner 2, kept the yard a mess and flew so many flags and never found a flag he didn't like. We had later found out that Owner 2 was a gay man who lived there for 30 years, flew his pride flags for quite some time. Fast forward a few months, the bigot neighbor mentioned to our next door neighbor that trans people weird me out, not knowing that the parent of their child's best friend is trans. So what did I do? I made my partner mount a 3 by 5 foot progress pride flag on the fence that directly faces his house. I also bought a yard sign that has a trans flag on it that says, Hate has no home here, which also faces his house directly. Little did he know that not only am I a huge ally of the LGBTQ community, I'm a big advocate for trans rights. I'm also willing to fight fire with fire. He was really upset at us for putting up the flag, and I'm really glad I'm pissing him off. Bonus, there's a queer teen that lives in our neighborhood that came up to us one day and they said that they liked our flag and recently knocked on our door to ask for permission to take pictures around our yard for their photography class. I'm glad that they felt comfortable enough to approach us all because of the flag we mounted. I think more than anything, it's just good that OP isn't afraid of showing their support when their neighbor very clearly showed they're either at least uneducated or don't understand the LGBTQ plus spectrum. I'm imagining because of their flag comments, they're probably not the biggest supporter, but I think it's good that OP's not afraid and is basically putting this beacon up facing them directly that says they're supportive and a haven for that community. Our next story is from Satanic Frijoles. Bully steals my sack lunch. I was on great terms with my biology teacher in high school. We had a beehive in our classroom and the teacher was into local reptiles, so was I. One day he gave me a king snake in a paper bag, so I brought the bag to lunch with me. There was this horrid bully. She was big, mean, and not quite right in the head. She decided to bully me by grabbing my lunch. When she opened it up, 
The snake slithered out, so I charged across the lunch court to grab it, while she did a terrified sort of hippo dance to get away from it. She never bothered me again. The petty revenge? I didn't tell her that wasn't lunch, because I wanted to see what would happen. Totally worth it. I would love nothing more than to believe that this bully from that day on, believe that OP somehow went and ate live snakes for lunch every day. If I was OP, I would show up to lunch with a brown paper bag every single day, just to really drive the point and drive some fear into that big old bully. Our next story is from Club Ancha. Idiot neighbor eavesdrops and I win. My neighbor is an idiot and we've been having issues with her from the start. Six hour relentless dog barking four days a week for years, yelling at me for stealing water flowing downhill, dead rabbit on the doorstep, the usual property line arguments, emptying her toxic hot tub onto our property, lying by the hedges to spy on us, parties, noise, etc. ad nauseum, just run of the mill bad neighbor stuff. Eventually we built a giant fence and it's kept the bullcrap to a minimum. Both yards have plenty of mature trees. We have three maples over 150 years old and a nearly 100 year old birch, a 12 foot cedar hedge, add that to the giant fence and the daylight is at a minimum in our backyard in the summer. Idiot neighbor had two century old trees and a very mature mulberry tree that hung over the fence in the only area that enjoys direct sunlight. Now this part is entirely our fault. One spring we built a patio there with a light gray stone. The mulberry has dark purple fruit and hers is extremely prolific. The week construction was finished was the week the berries ripened and began to drop in the slightest breeze. Sitting out there for any length of time, you would be pelted with berries leaving purple stains like you were shot with a paintball and sweeping a path was the only way to not step on them. If this only lasted for a few weeks, it would be tolerable, but mulberries are in season all summer. The amount of birds that feasted on the fruit and promptly deposited bright purple bird crap on everything we owned outside was unbelievable. Purple bird poop dried everywhere on the patio and beyond. We started putting tarps over the entire patio to collect the bird dung coated berries and emptying them into a bucket every time we wanted to use the patio. Remembering our neighbor's penchant for eavesdropping, I began to talk about mulberry wine. About how good my mulberry wine was and how this year's bumper crop of mulberries was going to make so much wine and how we were going to go on vacation with all the money I was making from selling my mulberry moonshine. Visitors joined in in the act, claiming they could not wait for the allotment of my fabulous mulberry wine and offering bribes to be moved up the list. I don't make mulberry wine, never have, and would not start with mulberry bird poop wine. One rainy early summer night, I heard and felt a tremendous crash. I ran into the backyard. The largest limb from the mulberry tree was lying in my backyard. A chainsaw was sputtering on the other side of my giant fence. The mulberry tree was coming down at night in a rainstorm. More evidence of her idiocy. There was a bit of yelling back and forth through the fence, me about her being a dangerous moron, and her to me about having a nice vacation without having mulberry wine to sell. She continued to cut down the whole tree instead of just the limbs hanging over our property. I laughed myself into the house, not quite believing my ruse worked so well, and revenge was finally mine. But that poor tree died needlessly. Barely a month later, a vicious storm blew through our area, splitting one of her mature trees in half and damaging the other so badly it had to be removed. Now the idiot has no trees, but all mine are still standing. I honestly think that OP's neighbor was one of those kids that, as a toddler, their younger sibling was like playing with blocks and having a total blast with it. And just because they were having a blast with it, they gotta go and take the blocks for themselves. They don't actually want the blocks, they don't actually want to play with them, they just hate that somebody else is having a blast and they aren't. Our next story is from Hokey Pokey Guest List. Neighborhood disputes started over grass and bins, ends with our tenants leaving. My kids and I moved house in March. Day 2 in my new house, I tripped over a broken paver. Didn't break anything, but I still needed surgery, a 3 night hospital stay, and a full leg brace for 2 weeks. While I was in the hospital, my partner, formerly ex-partner, now reconciled, it's complicated, Martin, my dad, my sister, bestie, and her wife had formed an emergency team. 
They kept my kids and pets safe and fed, and finished the unpacking. Dad and Martin did a little garden work, removing the broken paver and laying some old fence posts along the fence where the next door neighbor's dog was digging through. Week one, I hobbled to the letterbox and met next door's landlord, who my partner had nicknamed the Bucket Woman. She immediately told me to bring my bins in by 9am because it made the street look messy. She demanded I move the posts because the grass would grow through to her side. I explained the reasons for the posts and said that once the holes were filled in, let me know and I would move them. And hello to you too. Week 1 bin day, 9-10am, the bucket woman banged on the door. I'm still in PJs and a leg brace. She complained about the bins. I said my bestie's coming by later to help me dress. I couldn't do feet. I'd bring the bins in later. When Bestie pulled up, she had to park out front because my bins were in the driveway. I checked, the council bylaws don't have a deadline for bringing bins in. Next, Martin got temporary approval to work from home at my place. I got home and Martin was escorting the bucket woman off the property. The bucket woman thought nobody was home and tried to sneak in to move the posts. Martin said next time he calls the police. A few weeks ago the police arrived, Martin was at work and said a concerned neighbor called about a man and woman having a domestic dispute, and the man was destroying the fence. The bucket woman's out the front watching. Once they're satisfied I'm okay and there's no damage, I explain about last week and show them security footage. Later I see them speaking with the bucket woman, she is unhappy and she goes inside. I was working nights, and the police visit had taken up a lot of my precious sleeping time. I was fuming. Then the penny dropped. The bucket woman just let herself in while the tenants were at work. So I spoke to the tenants, and I was blunt. I asked if they were okay with the bucket woman being in the house while they were out, and said I'd seen her there at least once a week. In a nutshell, they were not okay with that. Later, one of the guys came around with a box of chalkies, thanked me, and said they were moving out right away. The bucket woman was furious at me. She says I made her tenants leave and got her in trouble with the rental agents too. She told me I made the street look messy and hang underwear on the washing line. So how will she get new tenants? I wanted so badly to tell her to get off my lawn. I feel bad for OP because they've got the neighbor from downstairs if you know what I mean. Imagine just trying to make it through life, working nights, just getting out of like a hospital stay, and every single day you've got to deal with some kind of crap from this landlord lady next door that just, no matter what, has something to complain about, always has an issue with you, is always a witch. At some point you're just like, God, I wish you would just disappear. And our final story of the day is from I don't know what I'm doing. I made a girl scream in front of 300 plus people. I like to think that I'm a nice person, generally speaking. I stand for what I think is right, and I try to help others in a way that doesn't make their failures look stupid. My classmate, who I'll name Sally for convenience, tends to think slightly differently. I normally wouldn't be upset at someone for not being loud, but Sally is loud in a way that irritates everyone. She makes fun of a dyslexic classmate of mine for not being able to read and loves to wait for after class to push people down flights of stairs. I would know as I was one of her victims. Since in a few years I would be doing my GCSEs, my school began to take end of year assessments more seriously. So we sit in the assessment hall and do our tests on a table by ourselves with all the other classes in our year. Sally had been… aggressive recently? Last week she pushed me down a flight of stairs and I landed painfully. Of course, she didn't get in trouble, and this is where my petty revenge begins. I found out that Sally isn't a fan of insects, specifically spiders. For the past week, I began spending hours walking around, going into public toilets and bushes, and collecting spiders, storing them in a jar. My little arachnid army has grown in numbers, and after discovering Sally's seat number in the assessment hall, I've been planting my little soldiers everywhere I could, even hiding some in her pencil case, under her chair, along the legs of her table, and basically anywhere else a spider could go without getting hurt. I cannot stress how amazing it is to see a bully scream her head off in the middle of an exam. She quite literally ran, shrieking for help. I've never enjoyed a non-calculator exam so much before in my whole life. I do feel slightly bad, and I decided to free the rest of my spiders, 
but I think ruining her grades and turning her into a joke is worth it to justify my dislocated ankle and bullied classmates. I think spiders will be my favorite insects from now on. I mean, I definitely would not have the gumption to do what OP did here. I wouldn't keep a jar of spiders anywhere. But honestly, if somebody pushed me down the stairs and dislocated my ankle as a result of it, and there was no legal action done against them, no suspension, nothing like that, I'd be wanting some payback too, so I don't blame OP. Salesman won't tell us the car prices. I was car shopping with my dad many years ago. We're both in construction, so we're dressed in somewhat rugged clothing at the time. My dad also had a heavy Indian accent, so usually experiences far more racism than I do. We were in a Toyota dealership and seemed to be reluctantly greeted by an older white salesman that obviously wasn't happy to see us. My dad's asking about a Tundra pickup truck and the guy just keeps on telling him it's very expensive. My dad's pressing more and more and the sales guy's practically steering him to the smaller model truck because it's more affordable. My dad's frustrated, so I start asking about the hybrid Highlander, fairly new technology at the time, and the sales guy's shocked that I'd even dare ask about such an expensive car. Wouldn't sit down with us to talk about packages and pricing, just dismissed me as a guy that could never afford it. We walked away and said goodbye to the guy, and he was happy to leave us alone. We didn't leave though, and were approached by another salesman in a few minutes, asking if we needed any help. 30 minutes later, we're both ready to sign paperwork for a new high-end Tundra and a new mid to high-end hybrid Highlander. I had been approved already for financing, and my dad was buying his truck outright. The original salesman finally noticed us and interrupted the process to tell the sales manager that we were his clients, presumably for commission reasons. We were patient and quiet up to this point, but my dad and I looked at each other and were ready for some revenge. I started to calmly let him and the sales manager know how rude and condescending he was by refusing to take us seriously and not even telling us the pricing of the vehicles. He denied it and my dad stood up yelling at him about being racist, about our family running a multi-million dollar company. We build and sell about three to five houses a year, so two million dollars is still technically multi-million and just going off on the guy. My dad ended up tearing his check in pieces and throwing it in the garbage. The old salesman actually took an angry step forward towards my dad, and I stood up to my full 6 foot 5 height and asked if he was seriously trying to physically threaten my father. It was utter pandemonium. The sales manager took the original salesman outside the office, and the second salesman joined them. We could see everything through the glass walls everywhere, and the manager was freaking out at him while the second salesman seemed to be confirming that everything we said was true. The sales manager came back with the owner of the dealership, who unbeknownst to us, also happened to be Indian. The owner apologized profusely. Then him and my dad spoke with each other in Punjabi. I could keep up enough to know my dad was retelling the story of our experience and then afterwards doing some wheeling and dealing again. We walked out of there with new and even better deals on each of our cars, and I made fun of my dad for not knowing that an Indian guy owned the dealership. As we walked out, the original salesman apologized profusely to us, but we kept walking. When we came back a few days later to get our new vehicle, we were told the original salesman was fired, and we felt zero guilt about it. If you had the money to go around and splurge, would you want to test people like this? Put on some old, well-worn clothing and see if those are quality salesmen that'll still try to help you regardless? Or would you say if you're going to a place like this that you should really look the part? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is from RBFam8191, Petty Revenge Against Spam Risk Calls. I still have a landline in the house. As a result, spam risk calls flood the line. I've blocked numbers, paid for robot services, asked to be placed on do not call lists, tried being nasty and rude, nothing worked. The calls persisted. The calls persisted until I got an idea, a special idea. I would make the scammers regret dialing this number. I would challenge the toxic masculinity with five or six simple words. What are you wearing hot stuff? Mmm, yeah in a deep voice, followed by a growl of anticipation. I don't know why the lovers hang up all the time. Just tell me what you're wearing, sexy spam risk. 
I mean, hey, as long as it's not a robot on the other end, you're probably going to get pretty good results trying to flirt with these scam callers. Me personally, if I had a scam caller like that, I'd want to be like, okay, listen, I know this is a scam, but I want to get in on this. How do I join you guys? I wonder if they would hang up, if they would just try to deny it while asking me to go pick up iTunes gift cards at Walmart, or maybe they would try to induct me, I don't know. Our next story is from Rogue Volcano. My housemate is messy, but today he's cleaning. I'm a clean person, definitely like my space is clean and visually appealing. Unfortunately, my housemate creates 90% of the mess. Dishes in the sink for a week. A dedicated dirty dish sink for him, freaking gross. Leaves fried fish grease pans on the stove overnight. Smells up the whole house. Tracks dirt into the house. The floors are nasty as freak. And leaves stuff laying out, like dirty socks and used dental floss in the living room. He's just generally dirty. Never mind the indiscriminate and loud belching sun up to sun down. I always clean up more than my share, particularly in the kitchen because, for the love of God, I refuse to put my clean food on his dirty counters. I try to leave the rest of the house alone, but it's so annoying. Usually I just stay in my room. We get along socially, but generally, he's not my cup of tea at all. The only time he ever does clean, and I help, is when we're having friends over, which is about once every two months. Tonight we planned on celebrating a birthday, but the birthday girl is sick, so she cancelled. I texted everyone else to let them know, but when I went to tell my roommate, I heard him doing the dishes, gasp, and thought, screw it, I'll tell him later once he actually cleans a bit more. For the past 30 minutes I can hear him organizing and cleaning, and he just spent half that time vacuuming. Once it sounds like he's finished, I'll be sure to let him know that tonight's cancelled. Until then, I'm staying in my room and letting him clean up his own messes, which I know he wouldn't do otherwise. It's not even noon and it's already a win of a day. On a scale of neat freak to absolute mess maker, how would you guys say that you are about keeping your places clean? I'll be honest, my stuff usually gets a little messy or disorganized before I get around to cleaning it, but what about you guys? Our next story is from Spagged Scully, Revenge on an Old Employer. I worked at a customer service call center. I was there for seven years and created 33 new or updated documents for them to use because I'm highly trained in Microsoft Office programs, Word, Excel, etc. These documents were used at three different branches of the company in three different states. When I started having emotional problems and had a CS psychiatrist, They decided to get petty and try to make me quit by treating me like crap, i.e. giving me the horrible shift hours, making me miserable, demanding I do extra work, and then stating I wasn't going to be getting our yearly raise because my work ethics had become erratic, though all of my coworkers were praising me for keeping up with their ridiculous demands. Anyone who's had issues with the company, who doesn't want to have to pay unemployment benefits and would rather force you to quit? will be highly aware of the type of tactics companies pull when in this situation. I had originally put a watermark on all of the documents, but when I became so emotionally drained from having to deal with their demands and actually had to check into a psychiatric institution for a 48-hour hold, I had enough. I knew I wouldn't be coming back after I got out of the hospital, so right before I went to the hospital to check in, I deleted the only copies of 27 of the documents that were for internal use only and locked the last six with a password that I gave to one coworker friend who had already given her notice and only had two days left. Two days during a time that none of the higher managers were actually present because it was the weekend. I ended up staying in the hospital for almost two weeks due to the emotional state I was in. During the third day of my hospital stay, The company called my house five times trying to get a hold of me to find out where I'd put the missing documents and what the passwords were for the locked ones. My family stated specifically that because they had driven me to the point of having to go into the hospital, there was no way that they were going to ask me for any information that had to do with the company. After the fifth call, my family told them that if they called again, they would report the company for harassment and stalking-like behavior. One of the managers actually tried to call the hospital to get a hold of me several times, only to find out that I wasn't allowed to take any calls from anyone besides my family. 
On one call, the manager tried to pretend they were family, only to discover that my family had given the hospital a list of my actual family members just in case someone from the company tried this tactic. When I got out, the company called me two days later. When I picked up the phone, the person that had called had been one of the biggest perpetrators in the way they'd been treating me over the past month of my employment. I told her flat out that the documents were gone for good, as were the backups, and the password lock documents were set to delete after a month of when I'd locked them. When the manager said they were letting me go, I said, thank you for the unemployment benefits, and I hung up on her. When a company you're working for drives you to the point of staying multiple days in the hospital and helping compound with other issues that leave you in the hospital for multiple weeks, you can't blame OP at all for what they did. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has a lot of awesome stories in it, like our next story from Satriala's Pork Store 1, My Upstairs Neighbors. They're absolute jerks. They're unbelievably noisy, inconsiderate, and entitled, to name but a few of their flaws. Myself and others have approached them to ask them to calm it down, but have only been met with a barrage of abuse. Nobody else in the apartments likes them because they're always impinging on someone else's life in one way or another, be it noise, their children running riot, stealing people's parking spaces, shouting at people. I could go on. They refuse to tone down their behavior, even after being asked very, very nicely. We have a large bank of mailboxes in the hallway. So now, every time I empty my mailbox, I put all of my unsolicited junk mail, which is quite a lot, into theirs. For a brief second, I feel like I've won. Honestly, having seen some people who had a lot of unsolicited mail coming in, it's honestly pretty nice just to be able to offload that stuff without having to deal with it. Whether it be putting it in a shredder or maybe like a recycle bin or the trash if you're just lazy. Our next story is from Electrical Ad 390. Sexist PE teacher had female superiors. When I was in high school, I was quite athletic. I adored sports and did well in any event that didn't involve a net at the center. Tennis, badminton, volleyball, etc. I sucked at those. In year 9, our class had a male teacher that would split the class into girls versus girls and boys versus boys. A vast majority of the girls in my class weren't interested in sports, and it made it extremely boring for me as a result, so I requested to join the other group and was told I couldn't. When I asked why this was, he told me that whilst I had the ability to play against the boys, most of the rest of the girls didn't, and if he said yes to me, he'd have to say yes to them too. I decided to boycott PE as a result and was sent to detention for refusing to participate. I'd always been a good student, so when I explained the situation to the teacher running detention and asked to leave to speak to one of the senior staff of the PE department, they had no issue with it. Now, this teacher had previously played for Australia in the women's hockey team and I'd also bonded with her on a school camp the previous year. She was absolutely mortified when I explained the situation and assured me that this would not be an issue going forward. From the next lesson onwards, the separation of sexes was abolished, and when the more delicate girls complained, the teacher made it clear that it was my fault. It never would have been an issue if he had just let me compete to my ability, and I would have cared more for the other girls' feelings on the matter if they weren't all bullies of mine. But as far as I was concerned, that was a flock of birds with a one stone. Yeah, to be fair, whenever we were doing group sports in my gym classes, there was almost always a sizable group of girls that would kind of cluster up. Like we would play dodgeball with the entire gym, and then there would just be that cluster of girls that stand all the way in the back in the corner, maybe like five to seven that just talk amongst each other while the game is going on. At least in that situation, it was all okay. They let them just kind of stick over there in their corner. And the only downside was inevitably when a ball went careening into the group. There was a lot of high-pitched screaming when that would happen. This next story is from many, many books. Didn't you know that other people may also speak a second language? Dealer at a casino was dealing to a full table. Two women friends were playing and were talking to each other in their native language. They were having a lot of fun and laughed quite often. After a while, they needed a break and left the table and reserved their seats. Once they were gone, one of the other players said that he spent some time in their country and spoke their language. 
He said that the biggest laughs they were having were when they made fun of the size of the dealer's, you know what, small thingy jokes the entire time they were playing. The player asked if he should say something on behalf of the dealer when the ladies returned. The dealer said, no, just give me a signal when they make a small thingy joke. The ladies returned and started to play. A few minutes later, they laugh and the player gives the sign. The dealer stops dealing. He looks sternly at the ladies and says, I speak your language, but I don't use it as everyone at this table speaks this country's language and it would be impolite. He then holds out his hands about a foot apart and says, and by the way, it's this big. The ladies were very embarrassed and left the table. I'm not gonna lie, what the ladies did sounded like fun. I'm not saying the joke sounded like fun, but being able to kind of joke amongst yourself about stuff while at least feeling like you're incognito does seem like a pretty cool thing, but it only goes as far as the people's proficiency in other languages around you, and you have no idea. You're really taking a gamble that nobody else would know that language. This next story is from Autumn Laughter. In elementary school, I got even with a bully. In elementary school, I was hanging out with another student, Allie, when Jessica came over and said she had to show Allie something. We both walked over to the playground and Jessica told Allie to stand in a specific spot on a higher ledge so she could see something. She kept pointing across the field telling us to look. Allie knew better as Jessica had been bullying her and had a reputation so she said no. Then naive me comes along thinking everyone has the best intentions so I followed Jessica's instructions to see what she keeps pointing at. Well, when I stood on the ledge, I immediately realized I stepped in dog poo. I was pissed and Jessica was cracking up. I took a twig and was cleaning it off my sneaker. I proceeded to take the poopy twig, found Jessica, and threw it perfectly at the back of her head. It stuck to her hair. Jessica never tried anything again. Well, yeah, you don't want to mess with anybody with that kind of aim. This next story is from AKS and ITD. Fine, I won't take any photos at all. My ex and I aren't together for many major reasons, but there's one silly thing I'll never forget. When we were dating, my ex complained that her exes never took candid shots of her. Fair enough, I'm not a fan of posed photos myself, and I wanted to practice taking photos, so I get to practice with my favorite subject who's willing. Great, right? Um, nope. Turns out the ex needs to approve every single shot I take. One time I took a shot of her sitting in the balcony. Nothing fancy, just a casual shot. She grabbed the cam, deleted the photo, and told me I was forbidden to keep any photos she disliked, even if I never showed them to anyone. So what am I supposed to do then? According to X, I was supposed to take hundreds of shots so she could approve maybe 10% of them, if that. What about shots that I like, even if she dislikes them? Nope. Must be deleted too. By the way, this all happened way back before smartphones and social media were a thing. I was digging out my pocket cam for this. Facebook existed but hadn't taken over our lives like it has now, and Instagram was still in the future. So it's not like I was blasting these shots all over social media, but no, X must approve any shot. I just never took any photos after that. That in itself wouldn't qualify as petty revenge. But we went on a trip to a really nice place sometime later, and I still inwardly grin that there isn't a single photo of her in that place. Especially after she spent so much time digging out her nice dresses and whatnot for the trip. I think we can all agree that it's a very annoying thing here for them to be like, Oh, there's never any candid photos of me. But then anytime you do take an actual candid photo, they're upset that it isn't posed. It's like, what do you want? Do you want a candid shot or do you want something that looks professionally posed and taken? Our next story is from emufunny7588. My sister doesn't want to free her live-in unpaid maid, so I got her fired. Obligatory backstory. Many of you have probably heard of families with strong hierarchy structure, normally with the eldest in the family having the most influence. My family's one of them, except that my parents are drug addict deadbeats, so my eldest sister... 31-year-old female, our entitled mother, raised all five of us. She's the boss of the family. She says, jump. Everyone says, how high? The focal point of the story is my youngest sister, 20-year-old female, who I'll call little sister. Most of us have had a handful or at least a couple of memories with our mother before she lost her stuff. Except for little sister. 
For her, Entitled Mother is the only mum she ever had, and Entitled Mother knows how to take advantage of that. All of us noped out of our parents' house as soon as we turned 18, except for Entitled Mother, who waited until little sister and our brother were raised and in their mid-teens to move across the country, and soon found jobs and accommodations for all of us to move to the same state as her. Little sister begged for years to move in with her, but Entitled Mother always denied, saying that somebody had to take care of our father and because she and her new husband needed privacy and space. That was until Entitled Mother got pregnant, she got little sister to move in with her, and she's been there for the past two and a half years, helping out. Now to the story. Entitled Father's family wanted to visit for a couple of weeks, so little sister had to stay with me for that time so that they could use her room. It's worth noting that Entitled Mother didn't ask or let me know about it, she just dropped little sister off. One day she saw me studying for my master's degree and said something about how she always wanted to go to college and this is how it went. I say, so why don't you? Little sister says, oh, I talked to Entitled Mother about it, but she said not everyone's the college type and that I wouldn't have time to work, study, and take care of niece at the same time and it's expensive. I say most people work and study and at the same time she can put niece in a daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't be that much more expensive than what she was already paying you. She says, she doesn't pay me. She already gives me food and shelter, and if I need money, I just take a shift at work. And this is how I learned that my sister was not only babysitting, but also cleaning the whole house for free every day. She was even only working 8 hours a week at her normal job because she was too busy taking care of our niece. Long story short, it took me weeks to convince her to apply to community college and then take more weeks on the actual process, but she finally got confirmation she would start in September. All of that behind Entitled Mother's back. She was planning on telling everyone the next time we all got together, which would be Independence Day. But before that could happen, Entitled Mother got everyone together at her house to announce that she was pregnant. Little sister starts crying because now she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Entitled mother gets deeply hurt and offended that she planned this behind her back. I butt in, our other siblings butt in, it's just generally a mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you'd be so selfish. If you like OP so much, go stay with her. These were all some of the things she said. She kicked me and little sister out, who stayed with me until they made peace. Both of our siblings reached out, one to say that I should have minded my own business, and the other to tell me that she was on my side but wouldn't say anything. After that, little sister moved back with her and didn't go to college, but they agreed she would get paid $6 an hour and be allowed to take more shifts at her job until the baby's born, and then go to a real college after the child turns one year old. I know it's messed up, but all of them, especially little sister, worshipped Entitled Mother like a god. I waited a year to act on my revenge, making sure my sister had saved enough money to live on her own. The revenge? First, what I did was research the legality of paying a homeless person in food and shelter. In the US, and depending on the state, it's illegal as long as you don't cross the line and the person becomes an employee. For example, you can give the person a list of tasks you want done. However, you can't say that it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You also cannot request someone to be somewhere at a certain time. You can ask, but not demand on the time. It comes down to a choice of words. Also, you have to comply with rental laws. If your local laws say that you must give 30 days notice to a tenant, then you must give 30 days notice to this person as well. I had proof of all of the situation, several screenshots of Entitled Mother admitting not paying and not allowing little sister to move out or get a job, and also admitting to kicking her out whenever she wanted. All this technicality seemed worthless since no one would sue her, but that didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that her boss knew that if she were to be sued, it would be a sure case. Entitled Mother works for a civil rights attorney's office, so discovering she has a literal modern-day slave would probably get her fired. I could have just created a burner email and sent it all to her boss, but then they would explain to her why she's getting fired, and that would get me and little sister in trouble. So what did I do? Entitled Mother was always complaining about one of the bosses on her job that hated her and had tried to get her fired for ages. 
I went to the company's site, found the woman, thankfully she was the only Ashley that worked there, found her Instagram and Facebook. There, she had a post tagging her yoga studio. Went to said studio and created my membership. It took a few weeks of trial and error trying to find exactly what class Ashley belonged to, but I finally found her. Then I went to yoga class every Tuesday and Friday at 8am for months, slowly building a friendship with her. Around 3 months in, she asked to follow me on Instagram, and I was already prepared for this scenario. Having deleted the few pictures I had with Entitled Mother, after 9 months when our friendship was a strong baby, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I found out she worked with Entitled Mother. Before things could get awkward, I said, It's ironic that she works for civil rights, considering, you know, everything. That got Ashley's attention. I told her everything, showed every screenshot. I could practically see her eyes shining. They had their own history that's not important to the story. All you need to know is, Entitled Mother is a witch. Ashley wants revenge as much as I do. I told her about Little Sister's situation and why Entitled Mother couldn't ever know about this. This is why being friends with Ashley was so important. If I had just sent them proof and explained the situation, they would have probably just ignored it, since this was a very legitimate reason to fire her and they wouldn't risk firing her for a minor mistake and maybe getting sued. I sent her the files with her promise that Entitled Mother wouldn't hear about this, but she needed it to convince the other owner, who was the reason why she wasn't fired yet. Two months later, Entitled Mother was fired for minor mistakes, lateness, and general bad productivity. Small victory, sure, but I loved coming to visit her during the four months she was unemployed. She was looking so tired and miserable all the time since she had no money to pay for a babysitter and little sisters away at college. So she actually had to take care of her children. Moral of the story, check on your siblings. They might be living in a modern slavery arrangement. Honestly, just good on OP for looking out for their sibling and trying to make sure they further their lives and not get saddled down being the babysitter of this kid for the rest of their lives, being just stuck in a room in their mom's house. And our final story of the day is by an anonymous poster. A date stood me up and now my best friend slash roommate is attempting to get even. I'll preface this by saying that neither I, 24 year old female, nor my roommate, 23 year old female, are particularly vindictive or vengeful. And this just started as a funny idea that's now turned into more of a dare between us. I met up with a Tinder date, 26 year old male, a couple of months ago. We hooked up at his apartment and generally had a pretty good time. We added each other on Snapchat and realized we lived in the same apartment complex. So it had been convenient for both of us as well. We talked a couple times since then, but our schedules haven't lined up to see each other for a while, which brings me to the other night. I had just returned home from a kayaking trip with my friends when he snapped me and asked if I wanted to come over and watch Netflix. I said sounds fun and I just needed a shower since I'd been on the river all day. I tremble at the horror of being caught with prickly legs, am I right ladies? I took 15 minutes to shower and get ready and then messaged him that I was on my way. About 5 minutes later, I was outside of his building and I messaged him that I was there. But he still hadn't opened the snapchat or replied to either of my previous messages. I walked a lap around his building for the sheer purpose of not looking like a weirdo standing outside doing nothing while I waited for him to reply. Five more minutes went by and nothing, so I headed back to my apartment. It was only 11pm and being quite the night owl, I decided to stay awake, smoke some weed, it's legal where I live, and continue binging lost. Heck, we'll freeze over before I let a man ruin my evening. After about an hour, I checked Snapchat and he still hadn't opened my messages. Reader, let me just confess here that in my 6 years of being single, this is not the first time I've been stood up by a date after taking the time and mental energy to get ready. Heck, this isn't even the third time. And I consider myself quite a catch, so there's something fundamentally wrong with how single women are continually treated by men, but that's a different rant. I don't like to allow people to think they can abuse my attention like that, so I messaged him again. First, did you seriously invite me over and then fall asleep? Followed by, mess around on someone else's time. This crap is below me. 
I could have said something way worse. I could have insulted him or called him immature. Instead, I chose to defend myself and value my time and boundaries. After so many past people continually let me down or stood me up or wasted my time, it really started to wear on me. I don't usually go on dates or hook up with people. This was the first person from Tinder I'd made the effort to meet IRL since moving to a new state six months ago. It's very hard for me to get close to people because they always end up disappointing me. So needless to say, I have emotional damage. And my kind, empathetic roommate was not impressed when I told her lightheartedly the next morning what had happened because she was excited for me to get back out there. Not only did this man have the audacity to stand me up, dear readers, no, he messaged me at 9 a.m. the next morning. Okay, call me Hitler, darn. That's such a lame response for three reasons. It single-handedly gaslighted my feelings, belittling the fact that I'd taken time to go over to his place, and attributed my feelings on the matter to genocide, which is messed up for many reasons, one of which being that I have ancestors that died in that event. I really don't have the energy to deal with misogynistic jerks. So instead of replying to his childishness, I just deleted him as a friend. This all would have been forgotten if my roommate had not, within the past week, come across this dude on Tinder. This isn't the first time she's seen his profile, since we live in such close proximity, and that's how Tinder's algorithm shows you people. So she noticed he's since changed his bio from looking for a cute snowboarder companion to looking for someone to lower my stress levels, not raise them. This has sparked somewhat of a joke between me and my roommates about how fragile men's egos are and all that. Well, today my roommate mentioned to me that she had the urge to match with him, just to stroke his ego a little bit, and send him on a late night drive across town to meet up at her place and then ghost him. I joked with her back and forth about it for a bit before dropping the conversation, but now the temptation of it won't let go. She's dead serious about it at this point, and it would be easy to do since we could just give him the address to an apartment building where our friends live on the other side of town. There's a chance that he genuinely did fall right asleep within 20 minutes, and that's not a crime, but the unapologetic response was a jerk move. So should I let my roommate match with him to give him a taste of single girl medicine? This actually creates a very good debate, was OP with what they said in the wrong here. Like, let's say that guy did invite them over to watch Netflix, and in the 20 minutes they took to get ready and take a shower and get over there, the guy did fall asleep. Was OP overboard for saying all the stuff they did? The, did you seriously invite me over and then fall asleep, and then also the, mess around on someone else's time, this craft's below me? Or did the guy deserve it for basically doing a booty call and then just falling asleep? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments. Adult bully at Disney World. I'm a 24-year-old male who looks a lot younger. My fiancé and I parked our car at Disney. They directed to specific spots, so I couldn't have found a better parking spot. My fiancé pulls in to the best of her ability next to this absolute jackbutt who is watching and laughing with his girlfriend at her attempt to fit her tiny car between the white lines so that she isn't parked in the person to her left space and causing a domino effect. So this guy's in a truck. Not a huge one, just tall and loud. He could definitely fit his car between the lines. He just chose not to and was seeming to enjoy watching us struggle. We chose to ignore it after she was able to fit her car between the lines, even though the front of his car was in our spot. Her car was small enough so that we could both fit. After my fiancé got out, I decided to wait for this guy to get out of his truck as he'd been there first, and I still needed to gather some of my things before jumping out. He slams his door against mine, climbs out of his tall butt truck, looks at the mark he made and just visibly shrugs and laughed as he made his way to the back of his truck with his girlfriend. She looks somewhat shocked. My fiancé asks, did he just hit our door? I tell her, yep. Then I notice that he's still standing at the bed of his truck, looking over at me almost like he was waiting for me to get out to see what I'd do. At that point, I was pissed off. This guy seemed like he actively goes and does crap like this to be a jerk to people for fun and get a reaction out of them. He seemed like he peaked in high school and thinks that bullying others is how you impress women. I open my door. I don't slam it as hard as he did and leave a mark, but I definitely didn't carefully climb out so as to not hit his door. I do this while looking right at him. His smile immediately fades and this is what is exchanged. He yells, what the freak do you think you're doing? Me calmly speaking says, 
getting out of my car, him realizing that I'm not going to get into a fist fight in a Disney parking lot, said, uh, just learn to be careful, mate. I say, I'll learn to be careful when you learn to park and act like an adult. He then went on to his girlfriend about stupid Americans, but I think this guy was used to acting like a jerk to people and not getting told off because he was a muscular looking dude who drives one of those douchey loud and tall trucks. I felt bad for the woman. She seemed genuinely shocked and embarrassed and kept trying to pull him away. I know this is small, but I was proud for standing up for myself. I'd gotten pushed around a lot in my life, but I felt the guy was disrespecting my fiance as it was her car and I just couldn't have that. As we walked into the park, my fiance grabbed my hand and nuzzled her head into my shoulder and told me she loves me. For the first time, I felt like a good man and it made me proud that I didn't let my anger get the best of me and lose my temper by getting into an unneeded fight or yelling obscenities. I got the point across that I wasn't going to be walked on, but I kept my cool and remained calm. In your guys' opinions, is OP's revenge here enough for a jerk like that? Basically, they left a mark on OP's girlfriend's car, so OP left a mark in that guy's truck. Is that enough revenge against this jerk who was laughing and did that? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Tundra Taurus. You plan on eating the entire family-sized bag of chips to yourself and don't want to share? I'll be the shining example and get you a special snack next time. This was about 10 years ago. Gardettos, of all things, reminded me of sharing snacks with my brothers on movie night and how I hated sharing out of one bowl because my brothers would eat all the tasty bits and leave nothing but plain breadsticks, even if it was a communal snack. It was literally competitive eating and I learned quickly to get my own bowl if I wanted pretzels or rye slices. This eventually led to everybody just picking their own single serve snack and calling it good. My littlest brother is a big guy taller than anybody else in the family, and he liked his food. My belt loops say I don't have any room to talk myself, so I'm not putting him down in any way. This was just the fact of the time. After venturing into adulthood, I was back home for an extended visit. Both my brothers were still living at home, and by this time, movie night was a bygone memory. Buying snacks for the weekend was still a thing, though. Not sure if it was early in my visit or if I just missed the snack boat, but I ended up without one weekend. My youngest brother came home with a family-sized bag of corn chips and a jar each of cheese and salsa. What a guy, he's so sweet, he's taking it all into his room. Not a huge deal, just not how I remember things operating. I don't need snacks, but after listening to the bag crinkle from the living room for so long, I caved and asked if he'd share a bowl. Gladly denied, not enough to share. He wasn't a jerk about it exactly, he was apologetic in his no, and I respected it. Pulled the face maybe, but I'm not starving, I just wanted something tasty. And he had paid for the food with his own money, not the family's, and was within established house boundaries. The thing my brothers might not have even noticed about themselves at the time was that they would eat what was opened until it was gone. It didn't matter to them the amount of servings in a package, it would all be eaten. The after effects of growing up with tons of siblings, we have more but they aren't a part of the story. If you didn't get in and get it when there was some, you probably wouldn't get any. So I decided to kill my brothers with kindness and instead of sticking to buying just myself a snack, I gave each of them a one pound bag of dried apricots. I bought myself beer and went to a friend's for the weekend. My brothers never said anything to me, why would they? But my dad and I were talking later that week and he wondered if there was a flu going around because my brothers had spent the entire weekend fighting over the upstairs toilet. I laughed so hard and had to tell him what I did. He had been big into pranks in his youth and appreciated the humor of it. He was my muse in the situation, honestly. He laughed a bit about it, but did give me a stern look that said I wouldn't be pulling a similar stunt with him should I be inclined to try. I only just remember this while talking with my mom, who was completely clueless about the interaction. I wonder if my little brother will find this post, and I can finally live guilt free. Hey man, Opie did their brothers a serious service here, they would have never have gotten nearly as much fiber in their lives without Opie stepping up to the plate and giving them those apricots. Our next story is by Al Bondigas. My mom sweater revenge on my dad. I just remembered an incident of petty revenge that my mother inflicted on my father more than 50 years ago. My dad's a great guy with many wonderful qualities, but back in his younger days, he did have a bit of a vain streak, and he's always been stubborn as heck. 
One day, my mom was out shopping and found a sweater on sale she thought he would like. Before he tried on the sweater, my dad got a look at the label and noticed she'd brought home a size large. Helen, you know I don't take a large, he protested. She said, Bob, why don't you just try it on? I think this one will actually fit you. That was a non-starter. My father dug in his heels and shifted into his pompous mode, and believe me, no one ever did pompous better than my old man. The dude is a world champ at pomposity. Helen, I always wear medium, and you should know that by now. My mom was not about to get flustered. She said, all right, Bob, I'll take it back and exchange this one for a medium. My dad was pleased that he'd made his point so quickly and convincingly and walked away looking smug. My mom went straight back to the store, but came home with not one, but two identical sweaters. One in size medium and one in size small. Then she grabbed her sewing kit and swapped out the labels. When my dad got home, she gave him the small sweater with the medium label, then watched as he struggled to get his head through the collar. Does that fit better, Bob? Much better, Helen, thank you, he answered, with his eyes bugging out and the sweater gapped open over his belt. Dad wore the sweater around for a while that day, but I don't remember if he ever wore it again. One thing I can be sure of, he was not about to admit that maybe this sweater actually did feel a tiny bit snug. My mom was not normally one for extravagance, but I'm pretty sure having the story to share with a trusted few confidants was very much worth the price of two clearance sale sweaters. She passed away five years ago, but my dad's still around and sharp as an almost new tack at age 99. I wonder if the time has come yet to let him in on the stunt, or if you'll get all pompous at me for confronting him with the truth that he actually did once need a size large. Ah, no sense in rushing things. I'll wait a few more years to make sure. Well, you gotta give your dad one thing. He is a stubborn guy that refuses to admit defeat. They were willing to get choked out wearing that super small sweater on them, rather than just admit that they were wrong. Our next story is by a non-nom-nomaly. The best revenge is to be and do better. When I was a young man, I worked managing a children's after-school project. We had one kid there who could be problematic and lash out physically at others. One day, he did just that, to me, and I have training regarding restraint procedures. I had to restrain for about 10 seconds. Nothing harmful or anything, exactly how we were trained to do it. I informed his stepdad when he came to collect him, explained everything that had happened, explained the anger and his lashing out and kicking me, showed him the bruises on my legs. The following day, I get a visit from the head of the council department I worked for. A complaint had been made. The police had been informed, and I've been suspended from all four jobs I worked with the local authority. Child care and youth work. I'd just left the residential social side of my work. Turns out that this kid's mom had just qualified as a social worker and had started pulling all of the strings that she could with her new colleagues. She tried to get me arrested and charged with assault. That went nowhere as there was no case to answer and the police interviewed me and later informed me that they couldn't even believe it had been brought to them in the first place. But here's where it gets crazy, is that there was literally a witch hunt started. Lies were told within the council by this woman, backed up by friends in the same department. A sham internal investigation was carried out. The management committee of the after-school project I managed was directly threatened with being blackballed themselves. This included site manager of the school, a police officer, and other people who worked with children in some form. They panicked and decided to let me go, but they wrote and told me of the threats made to them. The council's investigation then relied heavily of this dismissal as reason enough to terminate me from all my other roles. What they failed to realize was that I'd been collating everything I could. People I knew within the council passed me copies of emails. I had nearly eight years service with them and I qualified for legal help to sue them for the dismissal. That's exactly what I did. And they didn't even want it to go as far as a tribunal because their case was non-existent and relied on assumptions and unprovable rumors spread by their own staff. Let's just say that I had to sign an NDA and couldn't talk about it for 10 years. And I had a not so insignificant payout. Now comes the petty revenge part. Four years ago, I ran into this kid, now a fully grown adult in his early 20s. I was stood behind him in the supermarket and he eventually recognized me and started to say something snotty to his friend about me. I leaned forward and said, 
Tell your mom I said thanks. If not for the lies and BS she tried to pull, I'd have never have had insert large sum of money here to buy my house with. It paid 60% of it up front. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Gave him a wink and smiled. The look on his face, priceless. He literally started to turn purple and his friend kept asking him, what lies did you tell to get him that kind of payout? In the end, he dumped his shopping basket and stormed off. I moved one place closer to the checkout with the biggest poop-eating grin on my face you've ever seen. Now I'm not saying it was necessarily worth it, but being able to afford 60% of an upfront down payment on a home with that settlement money, that was probably a pretty good settlement right there. Especially if you were able to turn around and still find new work elsewhere in a similar field. Our next story is by Swish Leafy. Forced me to stay longer at work and not pay me? I'll ruin your business for a day. About a year ago, I was a waitress at a family-owned diner. It was Mother's Day and a Sunday, so you can imagine how busy the diner was. The diner had 12 tables and I was the only actual waitress. Normally, my boss, the owner, would be helping me with tables on busy days. I show up to work and already people are in the diner waiting to be served. My boss is nowhere to be seen. I was stressed out because it was just me and the cook. No dishwasher or busser. Within an hour, the restaurant was packed. I was responsible for serving everyone, taking pickup orders on the phone, managing online orders, cleaning the dishes, and bussing the tables. 12 tables all by myself. I call my boss asking her where the heck she was. Doesn't pick up the phone. After 5 hours, my shift was about to end. The restaurant was still packed. I call my boss and she finally picks up. I ask her when she's coming as my shift is almost over. The restaurant's packed. This woman has the nerve to ask me, can you stay for two more hours? I had a doctor's appointment that I forgot, sorry. I calmly tell her my shift ends at 1, so I'm letting you know that someone needs to be here to take orders. She begs me to stay, that she has no one to be at the diner. I almost feel bad, but this woman's made me stay for 15 to 20 minutes after my shift ends and not paid me for those minutes, so I hang up and walk out. The next day, my boss is furious with me, asks me why on earth I thought my behavior was professional. I then reminded her that I had obligations outside of work and that I could not stay longer because she had forgotten to manage her time right. I was tempted to tell her I had a doctor's appointment too, but alas, I did not. Surprisingly, I wasn't fired. There were angry customers, lots of meals comped, and the cook closed the diner temporarily. But I was the only worker who kept that diner running, so she had no choice but to keep me. A few months ago, I put in my two weeks notice. My boss begged me to at least stay on the weekends. Told me, no, you have to work weekends, I need you here. I told her, unfortunately, I'll be working at my new job during that time, so I won't be available on weekends. Even though I put in my notice for two weeks, I ditched after a week and blocked her on everything. I now make twice as much at an easier job. It's definitely hilarious that this owner of this restaurant who did a no-show at their own establishment has the gall to call OP out for being unprofessional. That said, they probably must have been underpaying their people because I feel like they shouldn't have had any issue getting enough people in to at least run the place. Considering OP left and got paid twice at an easier job, the pay at this place probably sucked. Our next story is by No Cell 9903 Karen on a plane. I was on an airplane, and right when we landed, a Karen in the back unbuckled and darted to the front of the plane to get off first. She didn't make any eye contact and felt that she was special. I'm talking about going from the very last seat on the plane, down the whole row and past first class, basically standing at the little kitchen thing in the front. All this time, the seatbelt sign was still on and we were still rolling down the runway. The flight crew had asked her to return to her seat until we reached the gate, but she was not even responding. Everyone was basically trying to just wait it out. It was a long flight, 8 hours. And at this point, we were exhausted anyways. Nobody said a word. Suddenly, the captain announced that we had a special guest on board and he'll be coming out to greet her after we were settled at the gate. The Karen stood there awkwardly until we did the whole rolling into the gate and whatever planes do when they land for about 15 to 20 minutes. Everyone sat there waiting to see what the captain was talking about. Eventually, the captain came out and asked the lady to please move back a little to get his special guest. 
then a little more, then a little more. He was looking from row to row to find a specific person. Everyone's watching and looking around to see who could it be. He kept going and going, asking the Karen to please step back a few more steps each time. Finally, as they approached the rear of the plane, he asked her to sit for a second while he grabbed the intercom at the rear of the plane. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce our special guest sitting in seat 42C. Let's give her a round of applause. The whole plane went wild with laughter and applause. I loved every moment of that. You could definitely be one of those people that try to get them suspended or barred from taking flights with the company. Or you could do what this lovely captain did and just make a total fool out of themselves, having literally been walked all the way back to their seat, sat down, and made a fool of. Our next story is by Uncool Frenchie. Want to wrap me up to management? Enjoy your new Facebook recommendations. So last week, I got dragged into a meeting with my bosses, and they told me that I, in no uncertain terms, could no longer use my iPad. I work at a hotel as a night auditor, so I'm not thrilled about this. And I also heard a couple of other allegations that I know originated from this one guy. Let's call him Jim Bob. Anyway, I come in tonight to relieve Jim Bob, only to find out that he's still logged into Facebook. I look through his feed and it's all sports and crap like that. Boring. Time to live in it up. I started liking a poop load of trans, furry, Scientology, communist, ballet, My Little Pony, anime, cosplay, and other such pages. Now his Facebook feed's starting to look interesting. I'm sure this guy is going to be overjoyed coming back to their Facebook and finding all of this very colorful and fresh new content for them to explore. Thank you, OP. Our next story is by Nolturn. No drinks on raised surfaces? Okay. I work in a car detailing shop who has just gotten a new manager a couple of weeks ago. She's instituted multiple arbitrary new rules, but this is the worst of them all. Throughout the day, I share a desk with multiple other people. This desk is used to cash clients out, to write up and print invoices, and to sign up new clients. However, only one person is ever clocked in to use this desk at a time. When someone is using the desk, their things are placed there. Cell phone, a drink, etc. It's been this way for years because it's a desk. Sunday morning, there was a new note on the desk, stating that there were to be no drinks on the desk because it's a raised surface. As most tables are... Here's the petty revenge. The management desk, they all share one raised surface, is 40 feet from my desk. It had four drinks on it, and because it's a raised surface, the drinks shouldn't have been on it. So the drinks got placed on the floor, and throughout the day, I removed the drinks from raised surfaces to place them on the floor. She must have gotten tired of having to get her drink off of the floor, and the note has been removed. I'm gonna be honest, I feel like... Having a rule where you have to keep your drinks on the floor is probably going to lead to more issues than just leaving it on the table. Like, think about it. If somebody just kind of forgets that they set a drink down, they're much more likely to knock it over on the ground next to them or in passing versus it being up on a table, right? Our next story is by Pending Twist. Got laughed at by everyone for calling me stupid. So after I finished my study, I took a year off before I started working. In that year, I also applied for a scholarship to a grad school, basically just testing the waters. But one day, my high school friend Linda contacted me and asked if I wanted to work back office 9 to 6 in a branch of a bar she's working at because someone just resigned and they needed replacement quick. I said yes, went for an interview with one of the three owners, Mike, and got hired immediately. The office was full of friends of a friend, so everyone seemed to know everyone, despite it was only a small office, and the best thing of working there is that everybody's nice and fun, but one person. Within the first couple months, I got a call, and turned out my scholarship was granted. I got the evening class for employees, so I could keep my job with very little adjustment. Everything went well in my first year. I did my best at work and made some improvements on the job, even though sometimes I would need to finish my essays during my lunch break. One day, as I was having lunch while finishing my essay, owner 2, Greg, came in and asked what I was doing. I was focused with my essay, so I replied simply, homework. He knows I was Linda's classmate in high school, but didn't know I was attending grad school. He asked for what, and I replied with a simple, school. I needed to submit it before my break is over. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any more time before class. 
so I typed it as fast as I could and focused as much as I could, until I heard him laugh. I glanced at him, not knowing what was so funny, and continued with my essay. Craig said, weren't you in Linda's class? I said, yes, focus, focus, focus. He said, oh my god, then you must be really stupid that you haven't finished college. I said, okay, focus, fo- wait, what? He said, you know you actually need a bachelor's degree to work back office in here. I say, "Uh uh-huh. Did he just say I haven't finished college? Saved by the bell, he got a call from a vendor that he had an appointment with that they arrived. I continued with my essay, work, and leave for my class, so we didn't meet again that day. But the next afternoon, he showed up in the office, which was unusual because that branch didn't open until 4 p.m., and when he met me, he shouted, Hey, there's the stupid girl. Done your homework, stupid? And before I could answer, he left to the bar. I wasn't sure at first what he was talking about, but when I remembered yesterday's conversation, I got pissed. I may be an idiot, but I did have my bachelor's degree. Mike and Linda even had my transcript. But this man didn't know about that, and I intended to keep it that way, and secretly wished that I would be there when other people told them that I was actually already graduated when he didn't even go to college at all. So I bear with him calling me stupid here and there for the whole week until that fateful afternoon when everybody gathered for the weekly meeting. When it was my turn to give my update, he interrupted me so much that the other owner who was my direct boss, Sam, told him to shut up. Greg, of course, used this opportunity to tell everyone that I was stupid because I haven't graduated. He told Sam to stop defending me and that I'm stupid for still being in college. Sam was confused because he knew the truth. Heck, he was the one who approved and rescheduled my shift so I can go to class. But since they're friends, he gave him the benefit of the doubt and asked him, So you called OP stupid because you think she hasn't graduated from college? Greg says yes, and I don't know why Linda recommended her, but she should have checked her background first. We shouldn't hire a stupid girl who couldn't even finish college in time. Linda says I did, and she has a degree. Craig said no way, she told me she was doing homework for her class later that day. This stupid girl is clearly in college. Me staying silent wondering what his problem with me was and why they're talking about me as if I wasn't there. The other four people in the office secretly enjoying the drama but knows what's going to happen. Sam said well she is still studying but... Greg says, there you know, you are her boss and you should know that she hasn't graduated and it's against company policy. We need to fire her. Linda says, so you called her stupid because you think she hasn't graduated? Mike says, okay, enough. It's not what you think, Greg. She's not in college. She's in grad school. I have her transcript from her if you wanted to see. And if anyone should complain about her degree, it's obviously not coming from someone who didn't even go to college like you. Greg says, but she told me. I say, I told you it's for school. I just didn't tell you which school. He was made to apologize to me, but for the next month, he became the laughing stock for what he said in the meeting. It's always the ones who really have no room to talk that go around like spouting this stuff as if they're superior. You got a nice title, but you're friends with the other owners. You weren't smart enough yourself to graduate from college, and you have your facts wrong. I just hope that this guy's smart enough to realize how embarrassed he should be. Our next story is by Renan003. Don't want to work on our assignment? Fine, neither do I. This happened a few years ago in college. I had a class about entrepreneur projects, and that semester was building a business on paper. Basically, we had to figure out what the business would be about, how it would work, and how much money it would need and make. I did this subject in a different class, so I could have Fridays free. So, I didn't know anyone in there except for one guy, let's call him Mark. So I teamed up with Mark and another three leftover people to be our group. At first, things were working like a charm, since we only cared about passing the subject and didn't give a crap about our grades. We would each do a part on an assignment. We had to deliver assignments each Wednesday, but we still got max scores on them. Our grade would basically be based upon all of our deliveries, plus some points on individual tests. Important info for later. Didn't take much time for things to go downhill. It reached a point on the project that basically we couldn't modulate the work anymore. The five of us would need to sit together and brainstorm about the next steps. More specifically, when we reached the point of how we would earn money with our business. Either that or one person would do everything alone. My group chose the second option 
and this would basically be happening for six weeks. On Friday, I would send a message to our WhatsApp group like, guys, we have to deliver X stuff on Wednesday, when do you want to meet? Saturday, no responses. Sunday, the two checks would turn blue, meaning everyone read the message, no response. Monday, I would send a follow-up message, no response. Tuesday, I would work my butt off and deliver it alone. Wednesday, two hours before the deadline, someone, usually Mark, would send a message, hey, how do you guys want to do it? Which I would answer, it's already done. And they would thank me and promise to release me from doing anything on the next assignment, which wouldn't happen, and the cycle would continue. After five weeks, I was fed up and got in contact with a teacher. Her response was that it was too late to do anything now because she couldn't assign me to another group. And she couldn't give me special treatment, but she told me to check my grades because most likely I already passed the subject. I looked on it, and with my individual tests, plus what I already delivered on the project, I got a grade high enough to barely pass the subject. This was kind of messed up, but all the individual tests, and project as well, grades were public. So I saw that no one in my group had passed. The closest one was Mark, but he didn't deliver one of the individual tests, so he would still need to do something to pass. I could then and there be the bigger person and say something like, Guys, I already passed the subject. Start doing something, or I won't do anything anymore. But I can be petty sometimes. On the sixth week, I didn't do anything. Wednesday arrived and Mark tagged me in the group asking if I did anything. I remained silent. Panic started arising. Group members texting me in private. I removed the blue scene icon in my WhatsApp and would read the messages in airplane mode so they wouldn't see me online when reading, except for the group messages because they would see that I read them regardless of leaving that setting on or off. So I didn't read them. Apparently when you don't do anything related to the project in five weeks, It's hard to figure out what to do next. Deadline passes. I go to sleep. Class was at nights, at distance because COVID. Wake up the next day. Several name callings, assignment not delivered, and the group threatening to report me to the teacher. My answer was simple. Teacher's already aware. I'm not doing anyone's work other than mine. You can all go to heck. And left the group. At the end of the semester, only Mark and I passed. They got their turd together in the end, but not enough for the other deadweights to pass. Was the sweetest 6. Grades from here go to 0 to 10. 6 is the bare minimum to pass I ever got. Mark never talked to me again, but it was for the best. I'm not gonna lie, friend or not, it's pretty easy letting Mark go in that situation. In fact, if somebody's gonna go and give you the cold shoulder like that in a group assignment, they're not a friend. And our final story of the day is by Desperate Link 750 getting a coworker fired after she sent me death threats for my beliefs. About two years ago, I was working at a major amusement park. I became very close friends with a coworker at the ride I worked at until she found out that I'm a Christian conservative. I don't care what you believe, most of my friends are left wing and I love them to death. When she found this out, she started calling me racist and saying that she was going to show up to my house and shoot me. Soon after I was let go, I was a whistleblower for a separate issue, but she still kept her position despite the reports I'd made to HR with evidence of her death threats. This is at a park where most of the employees are from other countries, so they were dorms. We were both 19 and she was living there. After I'd been fired, she posted a video on her Snapchat story of her drinking a bottle of whiskey. Everyone that works there parties after their shift, even if you have to open the next day. I called the park police, submitted an anonymous tip, and she was arrested, fired, and kicked out of the dorms that night. Don't threaten me because we don't share beliefs. Honestly, I don't blame OP for what they did. Whether you're left wing, right wing, centralist, nothing at all, that doesn't make it okay to send death threats to anybody. Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of getting a math teacher arrested. But first, if you enjoy this story, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our story of the day is evil math teacher smashed my iPhone, so I got him arrested. When I was in school, I always had a bit of a mischievous side to me. Playing pranks on friends, organizing practical jokes on teachers, doing ridiculous things in class to spice up a boring lesson. This kind of stuff was basically second nature to me. Of course, for the most part, it was just your normal adolescent fun. 
Harmless stuff like taping my friend Nick's pencils to his desk when he fell asleep in history class, or using a teacher's email address to sign them up for a Russian dating site. You get the idea. Sometimes, though, I would go too far, and a prank idea that had seemed absolutely genius in my head, everyone's going to love this, would go nothing like the plan and end up actually causing some real damage. One time in middle school, for example, I read online that ingesting eye drops leads to a sudden but ultimately harmless explosion of diarrhea. Seeing hilarious prank material written all over this newly discovered information, I came up with a plan to sneak into my homeroom the next morning and put three squirts of eye drops into the coffee mug my teacher always kept on his desk. What could go wrong with that idea? Well, quite a lot it turns out. When the day of the prank arrived, the first part of my master plan went off without a hitch. I silently walked into my homeroom when I knew it was empty, squirted a few drops in my teacher's mug, and quickly made my way out without being seen by anybody. When it came time for homeroom to start, I casually walked back into the classroom with everyone else, settled into my seat, and prepared for the show. I could hardly hide the grin on my face as my teacher took the first few sips from his steaming coffee mug. After a few minutes had passed and nothing had happened though, I started to get worried. Had the eye drops information been wrong? Was it possible I read false information on the internet? But that's when it happened. Out of nowhere, my teacher's face went white as a ghost. He stood up suddenly, started to say, I don't feel so, and then fell to the ground right beside his desk. As you can imagine, the whole class quickly erupted into chaos with people yelling and crying and running up to my teacher to see if he was okay. I, on the other hand, practically sprinted to the nurse's office, sure that I had just killed somebody and would now be spending the rest of my life behind bars. Fortunately for me and my teacher, however, the situation didn't end quite so catastrophically. I later learned that my teacher had only fainted that morning. As it turned out, he had a terrible fear of throwing up. So terrible, in fact, that upon feeling the severe gastrointestinal distress caused by the eye drops, he could do nothing but fall to the ground unconscious. If you're wondering, by the way, about whether the diarrhea thing ended up being true, well, let's just say that the classroom never quite smelled the same after that day. The point in telling you that story, though, isn't just to illustrate what a misguided person I was back in middle school. My teachers probably would have used much stronger words than that. No, the real point in telling you about the eye drops incident is that it's the perfect story for introducing another prank related story I have from my time in school. One with even more insane consequences and one in which, believe it or not, I was in the right. See, what's really messed up about what I did to my poor homeroom teacher, besides the fact that I, you know, caused him to faint and soil himself in front of a bunch of preteens was the fact that I had targeted an innocent civilian, someone who hadn't deserved, in the slightest, any sort of prank-induced retribution of that magnitude. A good prank, the perfect prank you might say, would be to target someone who more than deserves a little bit of sweet justice, someone who karma just can't get to quickly enough, someone so evil, so cruel, that even the old eye drops in the coffee routine wouldn't be enough to pay them back for their satanic schoolhouse sins. As fate would have it, I met just such a person in my sophomore year of high school. His name was Mr. Miller. My first introduction to the hex spawn demon known to mortals as Mr. Miller came on my first day of sophomore year, meaning I was around 15 at the time. I had just gotten out of my biology class and was now making my way over to the math department side of the school where my new geometry class was located. Although, looking back, I should have been anything but excited that day. I remember being in high spirits as I walked to my new classroom. One of my friends had told me earlier in the day that our geometry teacher had just recently been hired and that no one knew anything about them. A new hire? And no one knew anything about them? To me, these words smelled of opportunity. Maybe the teacher was an attractive young woman fresh out of college, single of course, and ready to be impressed by my teenage mastery of mathematics. Or maybe the teacher was going to be like 90 years old, hopelessly technology illiterate, and prime material for some hilarious, but good-natured, projector pranks. These hopes were quickly squashed, however, as I walked through the door of the classroom and began to look around. The first thing I noticed was the teacher himself. 
He was tall, broad-shouldered, and so bald that the top of his head reflected the fluorescent lights above him like a mirror. He was also frighteningly serious looking. As I stepped into the classroom, he stared straight at me from behind his desk, completely motionless and completely devoid of any positive facial expression. The next thing I noticed was the students who were already in the room. There was still five minutes until class started, and while normally people would be moving around and talking among themselves, the room was completely silent and everyone was sitting at their desks staring straight ahead. As I made my way to a desk, I noticed one of my friends towards the back of the classroom. I started to say something to him, but before I could, he sort of shook his head at me and motioned to the whiteboard at the front of the room. I turned around, and on the whiteboard, in big block letters, someone had written, Take a seat as soon as you enter the classroom. Before the lesson begins, there will be no talking. There will be no getting up from your desk. There will be no communication of any kind. Starting to feel a bit creeped out now, I turned back around and settled into a desk next to my friend in the back. I didn't even try to make eye contact with him. After what felt like years of sitting silently and staring towards the front of the classroom, in reality it was probably like five minutes, the teacher suddenly stood up from the chair behind his desk. Still not saying a word, he walked over to the whiteboard and began to add something else next to his pre-class warning message. Mr. Miller, Third Period Geometry, Lesson 1. After finishing his work on the whiteboard, he turned to face the class and began to speak for the first time since I'd entered the room. His voice was deep and he talked slowly, like he wanted to stretch out his words. As you can surely see from the whiteboard, he started, My name is Mr. Miller, and I will be teaching you all geometry this year. Before I can do that, however, We must go over some ground rules. He then paused to individually look at every student in the classroom before continuing his psycho monologue. First rule, there will be no talking allowed in this classroom unless you are specifically permitted to do so. Second rule, there will be no eating of food or drinking of beverages in this classroom under any circumstances. Third rule, at this point I started to zone out but Mr. Miller continued on and on and on, listing one stupidly specific rule after another. I managed to sneak a glance at my friend next to me, who seemed just as shocked and confused as I was. What the heck is this? I mouthed to him. He just shook his head in disbelief. When I finally zoned back into what Mr. Miller was saying, he was already up to rule 19. There will be a 30 question quiz administered every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of this school year. If you're unable to attend class on a designated quiz day, I will have no choice but to assign you a zero for that day's quiz. There will be no exceptions. 20th rule. At this point, I had had enough. I decided that I had to shake things up somehow. Surely this guy wasn't actually as strict as he was trying to make us believe. Without thinking, I raised my hand and interrupted Mr. Miller while he was in the process of delivering rule 20. Mr. Miller, I said. What if we have a valid excuse for being absent? Like, what if we're sick or we have to go to a funeral or... Silence! Mr. Miller was staring straight at me, fuming. Although you're undoubtedly too thick skulled to understand what's going on, you, he said while pointing at me, have just broken the first rule of this classroom. He started to walk over to where I was sitting in the back. I could see everyone else in the class turn to look at me with a mix of pity and horror. When Mr. Miller reached my desk, he began to speak again. Stand up. When I didn't immediately react, his voice was back up to a yell. I said stand up. I stood up then, staring straight ahead towards the front of the classroom. Now, he said, when someone in this class breaks one of the rules, there must obviously be an appropriate punishment for the offender. Luckily for you, however, he said looking down at me, today is the first day of class and I'm feeling uncharacteristically lenient. Therefore, you will only be given a zero for the first six quizzes, along with having to go to the principal's office to explain why you're missing the remainder of today's class. A zero on the first six quizzes? How is that? Out, he yelled, pointing to the door. The principal's office, now. Not in the mood to be screamed at anymore by a mentally unstable geometry teacher, I reluctantly gathered my things into my backpack and began to head for the door. 
On the way out, I could hear Mr. Miller speaking to the rest of the class again. Let that be a lesson to you all today. There will be no toleration of such delinquency in this classroom. I couldn't believe it. This was hardly the first time I'd been sent to the principal's office in my life. The truth was, my pranks had gotten me sent there more times than I could even remember. But this was definitely the first time I'd been sent out of the classroom for asking a question. And zeros on the first six quizzes? Who did this guy think he was? It was then and there that I decided something had to be done about Mr. Miller. As I approached the familiar entrance to the principal's office, I realized the opportunity to set the situation straight might have already have been given to me, and by none other than the problem man himself. See, the convenient thing about being sent to the principal's office so often is that you and the principal get a lot of time to get to know each other. And if you're smart about it, you can use that time to slowly but surely become friends with the principal. Until you get to the point that being sent to the principal's office is like being told that you've got to go hang out with your friend for 30 minutes. I had reached that point with Principal Nelson by freshman year. That's why I was smiling as I knocked on the entrance to his office. Maybe, just maybe, I could use some of that goodwill I'd built up with him over the years to subtly plant the seed in his mind that Mr. Miller was no good, that he needed to go. As soon as Principal Nelson opened the door, the game was on. Principal Nelson, I called out like I was reuniting with a long lost friend. How have you been? Did you enjoy that trip to Greece over the summer? The principal laughed and beckoned me inside his office. I can't believe you remembered the Greece trip. It was quite the time. Though I tell you, you haven't lived until you've tried authentic Mediterranean food. And the wine. He paused, like he had forgotten he was talking to a sophomore in high school. Well, I guess you're not quite old enough for that yet, he said laughing. I laughed with him. Not quite, I said as I settled onto one of the chairs in front of his desk. Anyway, the principal said, sitting down in his big leather office chair, what can I do for you today? Glass is starting off okay? It took everything in me not to laugh. Here I was, sitting in the principal's office, being asked what the principal could do for me. How did I do it? Classes have been pretty good for the most part, I said. I think I'm really going to like my history class this year. Biology seems like it might be a little hard, but listen, Principal Nelson... I lowered my voice trying to seem as serious as possible. I'm not sure what you know about this new geometry teacher, but he seems like he might be a little out there, you know, a little bit unhinged. The new geometry teacher? You're referring to Mr. Miller? The smile had left the principal's face, and he was now looking at me like a principal's supposed to look towards a misbehaving student. Well, that just can't be right. I know Mr. Miller personally. I say personally? Well, I'm not sure how well you know him, but today in class he was being really... Mr. Miller, the principal interrupted, is my cousin, and I will not have a student talking bad about a family member of mine in such a disrespectful manner. That is entirely inappropriate. Oh no. I didn't mean to be disrespectful, Principal Nelson. Honestly, I was just trying to say that he... Enough! I've let you go on for far too long spouting this nonsense. The principal took a deep breath in. I think it's probably time for you to head back to class. I sat there stunned for a second before grabbing my backpack and standing up. As I made my way to the door, the principal called out my name. One last thing, he said. If I ever get word again that you're giving Mr. Miller any trouble, there will be harsh repercussions. And I mean that. For the next few weeks after that trip to Principal Nelson's office, I didn't dare try any of my normal tricks in Mr. Miller's class. In all my years of getting in trouble and spending time with Principal Nelson, I had never seen him as serious and angry as he was the day I brought up Mr. Miller. I didn't know for sure what harsh repercussions meant, but I sure as heck didn't want to find out. In the meantime, Mr. Miller's class was becoming even more of a nightmare with each passing day. I had hoped at first that he would maybe mellow out as time went on, That maybe his first day explosion had been some sort of performance to scare us all into behaving. But that hope quickly proved to be pointless. The class was just awful. Every night for homework was page after page of practice problems, which all had to be done meticulously. Unless, of course, you wanted to get yelled at in class the next day. And sure enough, just as Mr. Miller had promised, 
every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday was reserved for one of his dreaded quizzes. 30 impossibly difficult questions that no one ever knew how to answer. Turns out having a quiz every other day doesn't leave a lot of time for actual learning. But the worst part of the class was Mr. Miller himself. Among other sick pleasures, the man seemed to pride himself on how many students he could make cry in a week. I think his high score was four. He would always stand at the front of the room, write some advanced problem on the whiteboard that he knew we wouldn't understand, and then pick a student at random to go up and solve it. Everyone dreaded being picked, because if you couldn't solve the problem, as was always the case, Mr. Miller began to tear into you relentlessly. Have you been paying attention at all, and you're one of the worst students I've ever had, and on and on and on. One time, a girl ran out of class crying after she was picked to go up, and we never saw her again. Most people said she transferred to a nearby school. Others said she moved to a completely different state. After about a month and a half of this nightmare, I had had enough. Something needed to be done about Mr. Miller. I knew Principal Nelson wouldn't be any help. After that day in his office, he had suddenly turned cold to me, frowning at me in assemblies and ignoring me in the hallway. I knew my parents wouldn't be any help either. I tried telling them about how awful Mr. Miller was, but they just assumed I was exaggerating because I disliked geometry or something. That's when I realized it though. The best way to get to Mr. Miller was through Mr. Miller himself. See, there were two things I knew about him for certain. The first was that Mr. Miller hated being disrespected by students. Disrespect or backtalk or anything at his expense was basically guaranteed to get under his skin. And the second thing I knew was that Mr. Miller had the shortest temper imaginable. The man was the literal definition of a lit fuse. Maybe then, if I couldn't get him in trouble with the school, I could make him do something that would get him in trouble with the law. What I had in mind was a long shot, but I knew there was a chance. On the day of Operation Get Miller Fired, I brought two extra things to school with me, a permanent marker and an old iPhone that I no longer used. Right before geometry was supposed to start that day, I quietly snuck into the classroom while I knew Mr. Miller would be in a staff meeting. Then permanent marker in hand, I wrote this on his precious whiteboard. Mr. Miller has as much intelligence as he does hair, and then quickly ran back out into the hallway. Once it was time for class, I casually walked in and sat at my desk in the back. Mr. Miller still wasn't back from his staff meeting. As people began to make their way into the classroom, someone noticed the message on the whiteboard, and soon laughter was spreading throughout the entire room. Then Mr. Miller walked in. As he made his way to the desk, he noticed my craftsmanship on the board and immediately flew into rage mode. Who did this? Who did this? I want to know who did this now. When no one answered him, his yelling only got louder. This whole class will be severely punished if no one confesses to this act of vandalism right now. Still, no one in class said anything. Then, still fuming, Mr. Miller walked to his desk and grabbed an eraser. Say goodbye to your little act of rebellion because this ends now. As Mr. Miller walked back to the whiteboard, eraser in hand, I pulled my old iPhone out of my pocket and began recording. When Mr. Miller got to the board, he took a long, dramatic sweep of the eraser over my message. When the permanent marker stayed on the board, the whole class erupted into laughter. Mr. Miller was furious now. I will not be disrespected like this in my own classroom. Then he noticed me in the back, recording on my phone, and purposely laughing as hard as possible. You, he said as he stormed over to my desk. Of course it was you. Who else would be stupid enough to do something like this? When he had nearly reached my desk, I quickly nodded to a friend next to me, who then pulled out my actual phone and began recording. The next thing I knew, Mr. Miller was towering over me. Scared as honestly as I was, I kept the iPhone camera pointed up at him and continued to laugh. You may have thought you were going to get a cute little video out of this whole stunt, he said, but think again. He grabbed the phone out of my hand, raised it over his head, and violently threw it against the ground. As little bits and pieces immediately flew everywhere, I started to genuinely laugh. Somehow, my plan had worked perfectly. The phone was ruined, and most importantly, my friend had gotten it all on video. 
After school got out for the day, I immediately made a beeline for the police station, which was within walking distance of my school. Broken iPhone in one hand, and completely functional iPhone in the other. I had done the research already, and knew that if I could provide the police with Mr. Miller's name and address, and the video of him breaking the phone, he stood no chance. Surely a misdemeanor vandalism charge would be enough to get him fired. When I walked into the police station, I made my way to the receptionist at the front and told her I wanted to file a vandalism report. After waiting in the lobby for about 30 minutes, I was finally ushered into a back room where an officer began to ask me questions. Property that was damaged, defaced, or destroyed. I pulled out the plastic bag holding my smashed iPhone and the officer typed a few words into the computer in front of him. Okay, an estimated monetary value of total damages incurred? Around $250, I said. The man continued to type on his keyboard. When we finally got past all the technicalities and the officer asked me who had damaged the phone, I perked up. Robert Zenhel Miller, I said proudly. He's a teacher at my school. The officer raised an eyebrow at me but continued to type into his computer. After a few moments, he made a confused sound. Is there something wrong? I asked. Our system's not showing any record of a Robert Zenhel Miller residing in this state, the officer sighed. Look, if you'll just give me the address for this individual and leave us your name and phone number, we'll check it out and get back to you as soon as we can. I say, but I have a video. He says, we appreciate you coming down here, young man. We can take it from here. Dejected, I made my way out of the police station. No Robert Miller in this state? Then who the heck was the guy who broke my phone? I didn't see anything else I could do though, so I walked back home and hoped for the best. After a week had passed and Mr. Miller was still at school, teaching and torturing students even more intensely than before, I pretty much lost hope. I started to forget about the stupid police report and resigned myself to an awful rest of the year. Then one day, about two weeks after I filed the vandalism report, the news hit the school. I was walking towards the main entrance in the morning when I noticed a group of five students gathering around someone in the middle. The guy was showing people his phone, and everyone seemed in shock. Curious, I walked over to them to see what was up. What's so crazy over here, I asked. One of the guys turned around and looked at me like I was stupid. You seriously haven't heard? Principal Nelson got fired. And also that new geometry teacher, uh, Mr. He turned to his friend next to him for help. Mr. Miller, the friend said. Right, right, Mr. Miller, the guy continued. Apparently this Miller guy was involved in some serious stuff. He had warrants out for his arrest in another state. Miller wasn't even his real name, they're saying. I thought I was dreaming, the guy continued. And apparently Principal Nelson knew about all of it. The guy was his brother or cousin or something and he gave him this job so he could hide from the law or whatever. Wow, I said. That's crazy, right, the guy said. I nodded absolutely dumbfounded and continued into the school. After a few moments, a smile crept onto my face. I hadn't felt this happy since school had begun two months ago. Over the next few days and weeks, the full story gradually came out. How Mr. Miller had been wanted for tax evasion and money laundering in two other states. How he had changed his name and moved to my town to get away from the police how Principal Nelson had pulled a few strings to get him a job teaching geometry, a subject he, in reality, knew nothing about, and how he had been discovered after police went to his address to investigate a misdemeanor vandalism charge. I never did tell my parents or anyone at the school about the part I played in Mr. Miller getting arrested. For one thing, I really doubted anyone would have ever have believed me, but it also felt kind of poetic in a way. Me, the lifelong prankster, constantly clamoring for attention and laughs with my pranks, somehow silently bringing a criminal to justice without anyone knowing. Through a prank? I think even the fainting eye drops teacher would have been proud of me. I'm not gonna lie, this story almost wasn't pro-revenge, this was almost nuclear revenge. While I was reading this story, I started thinking about how all the teachers I had growing up were, and if I ever had anyone as angry as this guy was, you know, pre-finding out about his misdemeanor and stuff. And legitimately, I've had a few teachers who would literally yell at students. Apparently, one of the teachers I had actually threw a book at a kid one time. Wasn't during my class period, though. 
it made me wonder like, for all you guys in the comments, have you ever had a teacher that was this angry, upset, uptight? I'd like to know about your guys' school experiences in the comments down below. As for this guy, this dude was insane, and honestly it's kind of scary after you go back and realize that shift in behavior from the principal, and like how much stuff was really being covered up behind the scenes. This was a dude who should have been behind bars and not been covered up for, let alone covering up for him by giving him this job where he's alone with kids in a room literally like all day. I'm just kind of wondering what charges that principal would have gotten from all this. I was told to do what I needed to do, so I did it. This is very recent. I was living in a very bad part of a major metropolitan city that has lots of bad parts. After I moved in, I started noticing a lot of things that were unsafe. Most of the things I brushed aside because they didn't necessarily affect me. Three things I complained about were the fact that the common areas and most of the bedrooms had no smoke detectors. Then, because I got home when it's very dark, I complained about the porch lights not working. I was promised over and over that this would be fixed, but it never was. I pressed harder and threatened to call the city. I also withheld my rent at this point. The landlord, female, told me, there's nothing wrong with the house, do what you need to do. So I did, I called the city. An inspector came out and I showed him around the property. There were areas I couldn't give him access to, like the garage or the other tenants' rooms. He took lots of pictures and pointed out dozens of safety issues and building code violations. Turns out the slumlord, referring to the owner, converted a two-story house, four bed, two bath, into a three-story house with nine bedrooms and nine bathrooms with no permits from the city. He, the owner, also had the home classified as an owner-occupied single-family home. Although it clearly was not as there was no owner occupancy and there were 10 unrelated roommates. The landlord, female, harassed me through the whole process. She took my parking spot away and pitted other roommates against me. To make matters worse, she told everyone I wasn't paying rent. So now I have these witches ganging up on me. It was so bad that I couldn't be in any of the common areas even for one minute without being harassed. I also got a bunch of notices accusing me of random things and an eviction notice because I wasn't paying rent. The report from the city came out and it had over a dozen violations, including some very serious ones. It was going to cost them tens of thousands of dollars to repair the house to get it up to standard. The house started to become safer. There were smoke detectors, railings for the stairs, working porch lights, a carbon monoxide alarm, and he was forced to put a railing on a balcony that had none. Through all of this, he's, the owner, making $10,000 per month in rent, charging for parking, and there's another large house on the property that he's renting. Plus he, the owner, has multiple homes, 90 tenants in total. This guy, the owner, was making tons of money. But somehow the sentiment among some of the roommates was, how could you do this to this poor old man? My case went to court, and I got more time to find legal help. By the time the second hearing came along, another notice had been given as they had got access to the entire house. Plus, they were still in violation and had not cured all of the problems, so they got fined daily. Then my court date was a week away, and his attorney started to try and negotiate with me. I was asking for $16,000, and they knew I was going to get it because they were going to lose. I ended up settling for $7,000 and 30 days to move out, plus 8 months of rent forgiveness. I just did what I had to do. If you lived in a place that was so mismanaged, and not up to code, and inappropriate, and frankly dangerous, would you rather just try to move out as quick as you can, or would you want to see it through reporting them for every fault and flaw and code violation you could? Let me know what you would do in a situation like that in the comments down below. Our next story is by Objective Unknown. Pops makes dirty, dirty thieves literally eat poop. I really love sharing stories about my pops, my grandfather, the man who raised me, and I thought I would share another story of pops just being pops. Pops lived on the family farm his entire life, and that's where this takes place. It's mine now. The farm itself is huge, 80 acres of grazing and hay production land. Pops mostly raise cows and chickens, and another 120 plus acres of forest marsh and wetlands. Up near the main house, Pops had his veggie and berry garden, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, all the berries. 
Bob's likes to make his own homebrew, blame the Irish DNA. One fine summer morning, August of 2001, Pops is returning from town and he's greeted by a couple in their 30s hauling butt to their car parked at the front of our property, each with 40 liter buckets. Pops checked out what was going on, almost half the berry bushes had been stripped clean. Pops was not the type to fly off the handle, but he took a trip into town to look for the car and he found it. It was a couple of out of towners and Pops gave them a stern warning not to come back. The next morning, Pops was doing his normal start of the day routine, making breakfast and waking me up to do chores. As we got out, Pops saw them again hauling butt back to their car. Pops jumped into his truck, caught up to them and told them off, said if they ever come back, it's going to be heck for them. We woke up the next day to find tire tracks on the field and each and every berry bush stripped clean. We later found out they'd been hitting up the farmers markets selling fresh berries. Pops, not being the kind of person to take things laying down, especially if someone's messing with his future booze, there's a lot Pops did to ensure he was protected for the future, but I'm going to give you the short version. Pops decided to expand his berry operation to the entire field as well as get the farm licensed to produce and sell berries. In early September, I remember this well, made me do half the work, we filled the entire front field planted several hundred strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, and blueberry bushes. One thing, they're perennial plants. The season they're planted will be a very light fruiting, but the next growing season, they explode. Pops fenced off half the field and left a good portion open, easy access. Pops knew they would be back next year. He knew they believed they found a golden goose of free money. Well, the start of next growing season, Pops had a special fertilizer ready for the open part of the field raw human waste. Now, the thing about spraying the soil and plants with that is it's not treated. Even cow fertilizer is treated. But in its raw state, the plants being sprayed daily? Well, it makes the berries putrid. It gets deep into them and no amount of washing will get it out. And Pop sprayed every bush on the not fenced inside every darn day and waited. And as Pops predicted, summer of 2002, They came back. He caught them again, buckets in hand, hauling butt back to the car. Again, Pops confronted them with a stern warning, warning they'll regret taking and eating the fruit. It wasn't even 24 hours later, they were back with the law in tow, screaming up a fury that Pops tried to poison them. Pops just smiled and said, I warned you not to come on my land and steal from me. Those berries aren't for eating. The cops were about to tell him to just freak off and not come back, when Pops said, Oh, wait a minute. Pops came out with all his licenses packed in a neat little folder, licensing his land that was already zoned for agricultural use as a licensed food production farm. The cops' eyes lit up like, oh, I know what you're getting at. You see, up here in Canada, it's a bit of a big crime to steal from a farm, even more so if it's got all the licenses to produce food. At this point, I was on the porch watching everything go down. Man, the law screamed at them to sit their butts down while he called back up. They were taken off our land in cuffs. So not only did they get a mouthful of human waste-filled berries, but walked out getting over a $10,000 fine. I'm just imagining what would have happened if this took place in the southern United States. You'd probably end up with some pellets in your butt. Good thing this took place in Canada. At least there, you only gotta deal with a mouthful of human poop and a $10,000 fine. Our next story is by Crafty Bureaucrat. I orchestrated a vast conspiracy to get a coworker fired. I used to work at a hospital data center and the network operations group. We physically sat in a room 24 seven next to the servers to make sure things didn't catch on fire, monitored for alerts, and did routine things like swap out tape backups, but it was pretty simple work. This was ostensibly a tech job, but there were people who had been there for many years back when you had to change out printer paper and run a command from an IBM mainframe. It was on really specialized hardware and software that was difficult to apply elsewhere, so it had become a dead-end job. And because there were people who weren't tech savvy at all really, we weren't given much responsibility. You can't tell some people they can log into a server and others not, so we were reduced to the lowest common denominator. We were a network operations center where nobody was allowed to interact with any network equipment. Lowest common denominator, you say? Meet my new supervisor, Karen. 
Not her real name, but definitely her real spirit, had been there for over 20 years and got the job solely based on seniority. She was a sociopathic narcissist and one of the most unpleasant people I've ever encountered. Shortly after I was hired, we were bought by another hospital and combined data centers. Karen was demoted to shift lead and had to work with us in the 24-7 rotations. She was very bad at her job and our responsibilities diminished to very little. We had no agency to fix any problems of our own because it had to be a problem that Karen could solve. And Karen was both lazy and stupid. After a couple of years, I was promoted. On my first day after they announced the promotion, she said, you will fail just straight to my face. But she had a powerful tool at her disposal, the hospital bureaucracy. Since the place was unionized, the hospital had a just cause firing policy instead of an at will policy, even for non-unionized employees. This I think generally is a good thing, but on the edges, it set up a ridiculous situation where it was impossible to lose your job unless you were really egregious about it with repeated violations or you showed up drunk or high. We had someone steal computer equipment and they kept their job. It was nuts. And Karen had been there for nearly 30 years, so she wasn't getting fired without a lot of work. That's okay, she was terrible at her job. One of the most important things about the job was monitoring for an alert which would pop up and there was a procedure we had to go through in order for some data to go through. If we didn't do this, then a nurse wouldn't get their lab results back. So in one case, an alert came in, Karen saw it, then decided to keep browsing the web. Because of this, a patient from the cardiac ICU was going into surgery and the doctors and nurses operating on the patient couldn't get a white blood cell count I think. I'm not a doctor, I just work in a building with a lot of them. Something very dangerous for the patient, and the patient died. This still did not get Karen fired. The reasoning from HR? Well, it didn't directly lead to harm. She didn't even feel bad about it. Just a complete, soulless sociopath. I'm real pro-worker in general, but some jobs you just absolutely have to do. I was so mad she had to go. I kept a paper trail of everything she messed up on. It wasn't nitpicky. Literal life and death stuff here. Verbal warning, first written warning, second written warning, final written warning, termination. A slog and I'd rather spend my time doing anything else, but that's the way it went. Then she figured out she could work the system. As she approached work Armageddon, termination, she would tell HR that she was being harassed. The person harassing her was different every time, which would trigger a mandatory investigation. This investigation took about six months. They wouldn't find anything, and we would carry on. Except these warnings? They had a six-month expiration, so she could always reset the clock when it got close. Everyone was helpless. Even the CIO couldn't do anything about it because of the bureaucracy. Karen was a menace, and the entire IT department had to interact with the data center staff. And that meant interacting with her, and she was universally disliked. And she had 20 years until retirement, and she would outlast the heat death of the universe. Then I had an idea. What if, under the guise of developing skills relevant to the 21st century, required everyone working in the network operations center to pass the NetPlus exam? It's not a difficult exam, but it's not trivially easy. I felt pretty sure that everyone on the team fell above the line between able to pass and not able to pass, except Karen. We would give everyone better titles, a significant pay raise, and entrusted to do more with the equipment, which is something everyone desperately wanted. Then people could actually leave the hospital with transferable skills and do something else if they wanted and not feel trapped. I spent three years in meetings with HR, with my director, with the CIO, with HR again, job description meetings that took six hours to tweak small wording, hundreds of hours in meetings, red tape heck, absolute red tape heck. Do you have any idea what it takes to approve a significant raise in a bureaucratic muck factory like that? But the raises were crucial because it would absolutely not be fair to ask this of them. Pass a test or lose your job, well that a large carrot attached would lead to mutiny, and then it got approved. I also wrote the exam requirement into my own job description. It was important to still be able to do the job and not let my skills lapse just because I was promoted. 
Also, this meant I could cover for people when they were on vacation or sick. Plus, I also got that sweet, sweet pay bump. It went over well. I was nervous, but the plan made sense, and I was able to communicate that. People would be more marketable, the job would be more interesting, and most importantly, they would be making 20% more than they were before. And I think it really helped that I also gave myself the same requirement when I absolutely could have chosen not to. The hospital would pay for off-site training, they would still get paid their full hourly during the training, including shift differential for second and third shifts. We paid for all materials. I scheduled eight hours a week for people to go someplace quiet and study. The job itself had a ton of downtime, so people could study, but this was formally carved out time anyways. We paid for the exam, and if they failed, we'd pay for the second attempt. We were given eight months to pass the test. So this is how it was for eight months. I did not want Karen to have any excuse whatsoever and somehow convince HR that this process was rushed or unfair. Everyone passed on the first attempt except Karen. Karen did not pass her second or her third attempt, a bonus attempt. Karen, being the classic narcissist, thought this was all somehow all about her. That this was a vast conspiracy engineered over multiple years and hundreds of hours just to get rid of her. And she would tell everyone within earshot that that's what's going on. Yeah, okay, Karen. You realize how insane that sounds, right? Not everything's about you. Sheesh. Well, okay, in this case it is, but still. Only I and two other people know that. I remember the exact time and date we told her. She was in such deep denial that it could ever happen. She thought she was bulletproof. I don't think I will ever achieve anything more satisfying in my career. I'm not usually one to take satisfaction in seeing someone's livelihood go, but she was uniquely awful. She was a patient danger, and it had been nearly a decade of working with her by this point, and I was just so sick and tired of her BS. I was a hero the day after she was fired. I went to the main office for a meeting and people were congratulating me like I'd just had a kid or won a marathon or something, even the CIO. They were just happy for me that I didn't have to supervise Karen anymore. But in my head canon, they were congratulating me for pulling off this elaborate plan. Morale back at the data center was also high. We learned interesting things, a couple of my coworkers left for better gigs elsewhere. The ones who were content staying were able to stay, and we all had more money and job security. And because anything could set off a BS Karen harassment complaint, people were stressed out working with her. Her being gone was like a breath of fresh air. Newcomers were told stories of Karen, and they seemed exaggerated. They were not. In order to solve a very important and extremely difficult problem, I pulled off a vast workplace conspiracy that improved the lives of people I worked with in addition to keeping our patients safe. Getting Karen fired is my greatest and most difficult accomplishment, and I can't put it on a CV anywhere. If you were working in a place with a manager as bad as this Karen, would you be willing to put your job on the line and take a test to prove your competency just for the chance to out Karen and maybe get them fired? Let me know if you think that would be worth the attempt in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Thunderkirk. I was called an ungrateful brat, so I acted as such. Background, growing up, me and my sister had no love towards our father whatsoever. I'm not gonna bore you with details, but alcoholic, abusive, violent are the few that come to mind. When my sister got accepted into a much better but also further high school than our local, she moved immediately and rarely visited. We were 10 years apart, so I was 4 at that time. I grew up resenting her for leaving me to deal with his BS all by myself. But now I understand better, and we're on good terms. My local factory was so big that it supported my whole town. Virtually everyone worked there, so everyone knew each other. My parents too, but then it's purchased by the defense ministry, and they decided to cut off anyone without at least a high school degree. My mother was let go, and this was after she'd had me four months. My father, however, made it until retirement and was granted military status. Basically, they gave him an honorable rank so his pension would almost double, but also you have to act accordingly because, in terms of speaking, you're military personnel now. My childhood was absolute nightmares, so needless to say, I turned out to be an absolute mess. Anger management and mental instability are notably the worst, and I'm still working on them. 
When I turned 18, I enlisted. Two major benefits, it didn't cost money and I could never come home if I didn't want to. For me, it was literally a highway out of heck. Fast forward three years later, I got an honorable discharge. Turned out I had actual mental problems, who would have known? I got a bulk load of money and even more in the following months when they were able to process my military insurance. I came home to find my town incredibly underwhelming and my father hadn't changed a bit. Not wanting to spend the rest of my life in this heck hole, I took what I could and moved to the city where my sister was living. The last words dear old dad said to me was, you'd never make it. Because apparently being discharged for a mental illness showed that I was a coward. Also, I think he didn't like that I was tougher than the boy who used to obey his every word that I once was and that I stood up for myself more in the few weeks I've stayed with him than the entire 18 first years of my life. I moved to a new environment, took up a blue collar job, I was pretty beefy thanks to the military, and decided to pursue a career in IT, all the while taking care of my mental health. When it all started, some when during this time, he got diagnosed with cancer. I was told it wasn't dangerous, but operations were required. My sister had actually reconciled with him, partly because of my mother, a few years prior, and would occasionally bring my niece home to visit them. She was quite successful, so she decided to pay for the whole thing. Operations, treatment, hospitals, recoveries, it was all hers. She paid for this while moving into a new house and buying her first car. Those things are pretty expensive in my country. My father had a huge bank account because of his pension, but he didn't have to pay a single penny. After a year or so, he's on recovery, and all in all, things were good. During this time, I was struggling with working and studying, living paycheck to paycheck, and had to rely on a social program to get treatment for my illness. I visited him after every operation, though it wasn't anything tearful. If he didn't poke me, I was fine. After nearly a year of staying at my sister's house, he and my mother headed home after his doctor gave him a go. At that time, I was looking for a new job because the current job was horrible and it made my mental health actually worse. And I was lucky to find one where most of my schools were transferred and I had enough time to finish my studying. One day, my mother called in tears and asked me to come home that weekend. She told me that my father had been seeing someone else. Now, I must admit, I'd not put anything behind this man, but then I thought she was paranoid. She still is up to this day about everything. And I resented the thought of going home on a four-hour trip, both just for something that's utterly unimportant. So I calmed her and swept it under the rug. Fast forward a few months, I got another call, this time from my sister. She came back to visit that week with my niece to inform them that she was three months pregnant. What was supposed to be a happy union turned into an absolute crap show. Apparently when my father left his phone unattended for a few minutes, his mistress sent him a very sexy picture and my mom saw it pop up. Needless to say, all heck broke loose. My sister said that that was the first in many years that she saw my mother screaming bloody murder at my father, and when he tried to hit her, my sister threw herself in between, which prompted her husband to throw himself in between because, you know, she's three months pregnant. It all ended with a very teary trip back to our city after hours of hurling insults at each other. The only good thing that came out of it was my mother somehow was able to bring his phone with her. We convinced my mother to get a divorce, but she's the submissive housewife who thought divorces were worse than boiling live puppies. And I think back then, she's still somewhat hoping that he'd turn around. They've been together for almost 35 years at that point, so I figured something must have been there. She didn't want it, so we dropped it and decided to cut him out for good. Lo and behold, half a year after the incident, my father's side of the family started to contact me. I have a strict no-call policy where the only people allowed to call me outside of work hours are my mother, my sister, her husband, three of my best friends, and only recently, my boyfriend. So to my bamboozlement, my father, his sister, my aunt, and his mother all called within a day. They suddenly acted so nice and convinced me to come visit them. Obviously, that was all a ruse. After the incident, my father's side all blamed my mother and said she should have kept it a secret and not made a mess for the family's sake. They also disavowed me and my sister because we were ungrateful brats. After we did not accept their ultimate argument, he's your father after all. Out of morbid curiosity, I ventured back alone to see what it was about. Turned out, they wanted to sell his house. 
It was on my grandmother's land. Back when he was about to undergo his first operation, we didn't know how it would turn out. So he transferred the house to my name because, apparently, inheriting a dead person's estate in my country is a living nightmare. Out of convenience, we convinced my grandmother to give me the land as well, since she was very old, 80 at the time. This was back when we were on good terms. I knew for sure they would rather gouge their eyes out than follow up with any of that if it happened a year later. I smelled something in the air. I couldn't place it, but I knew it was there. So I told them nicely that I would think of it and immediately went back faking an emergency. A plan formed when I was driving back, and that's the first time I'd been so pleased about anything, I actually cracked a smile. I went to my sister's immediately, my mom had been staying with her, and laid out a plan. After a year of living in the city, my mom was much more open-minded, and it only took a little convincing for her to agree with the plan. The plan... My sister contacted a lawyer and asked what our options were. Because both the house and the land were in my name, they had no claim to them, and any paper that didn't have my signature on it would be considered useless under the law. They could try and claim it was rented out, but then they'd have to move far away and hope that I'd never be able to locate them, and I knew it'd be too much trouble for a couple of old folks. They could claim it's his life achievement, but because he and my mother never divorced, it's technically half hers as well. This is when I came up with an idea. I asked the lawyer, what if my mother filed for a divorce? He said it's highly unlikely the court would reward my mother's full claim unless we could prove that he was unfaithful before the separation. To his surprise, I could. Remember the phone that my mother brought back from that day? It was smashed during the fighting, but generally still in one piece. She asked me to throw it away after a few days, but my lazy butt just brought it back to my place and threw it in the loft. Sufficient to say it provided us with more than enough proof of his indecency. The execution. After weighing our options, I called to inform my father that I would come home the next month to make an announcement. He was eager to hear it. Upon my arrival, they were so nice and sweet and whatnot, but after I introduced my lawyer, it's like they flipped a switch and suddenly became vile and violent. I presented him with two options relinquish any claim to the house, or be served with a lawsuit. In my country, marital violations are six months probation minimum, up to two years in prison. After a lot of screaming and name calling and feet stomping tantrums, he kicked us out. So naturally, I assumed he chose the latter. At the first hearing, my mom, me, and my lawyer were present. It turned out to be another screaming contest in which he made up all kinds of lies about my mother. At some point, my lawyer leaned in to tell me that if the officer didn't stop his rantings, it's likely that they were buddies and asked me to let them handle things. The officer told us this case wasn't a priority, it would take months to process, we wouldn't like the paperwork, it's best to settle this out of court. My lawyer politely declined and told my father to expect another hearing soon, under much less friendly circumstances. He tried one more tactic in between, which was calling all the relatives and telling them how my mother was a witch and I was an ungrateful brat in hope of creating some kind of pressure on us. Very few of them took his side, and even if all of them did, I would have never let him go that easy. In the second hearing, he finally cracked and agreed to my terms, which were relinquishing any claim he might have had with the house and divorcing my mom. Basically, the only person who has any claim to the house now is my mother. I agree to let him keep living in it for the rest of his life though, but not anyone else, aka his mistress, whom he was basically living with. The revenge? This is where my work started. First, my sister gathered all the receipts from all the medical billings she's paid for his treatment. A few of them were missing, but we were able to put up a huge folder. I also pooped my pants learning how expensive cancer treatment could be, not a fan. When we had a general sum of the money, we billed him for it. This is very unethical in my country since children are expected to take care of their parents, but we threw that out the window long ago. We also knew it was not a criminal case, so we just went to small court claims and then sent in bailiffs to collect, which was just this lady. She went on with a I don't give a freak attitude, and when he failed to comply, she sent in the thugs, I mean the police, to start seizing assets. So say goodbye to wooden furniture, a 27-inch smart TV, a fridge, and a reclining massage chair, all were bought by my sister as well. He had to pay out of his pocket because that lady insisted they continue seizing whatever he bought until she saw the money. 
Although the final amount was halved, my mother, under the eyes of the law, shared half of that for some reason, it still cost him 70% of his savings. Of course, this wasn't about the money, we were just petty. We told the moving company that they could do whatever they wanted with the furniture. Looking back, I should have taken the recliner because my back hurts like a witch even though I'm only in my late 20s. After that was done, I contacted my local factory to file a report. Remember the sweet pension he got with the condition that he behaved accordingly? Clearly someone had been a bad boy. They let him go with it, even though it was a small town and everyone knew everything because nobody ever filed a report. But that's not the case anymore. I gave them a very detailed folder with pictures from his phone. To say they were sexual was an understatement. They immediately set up a hearing and he was stripped of his rank, making his pension down to just over half the original amount. I know this because old folks gossip like their lives depend on it, and my mother is not excluded. She was very happy having heard about that. It's all she talked about for a month. I was about to be done here, but a week later, my sister called to tell me that my aunt came to her door to berate her and her children. My sister was working from home. My mom also lived there, but had gone out for some reason. My sister just called security to kick her out and warned me she could go for me next. I was seeing blood, not because of some lame butt Karen that could cause me inconveniences at most, but because she was screaming at my niece and nephew. As a gay man, I know full well the bloodline ends with me, so I put all of my love into those little guys, to the point that if I had been there, I would have bitten her head off. So I dug a little and found out that my aunt was knees deep in debt. She was hoping she could leech some money off my father, if not from the money he made selling the house, then from his big bank account. Since neither of those were available anymore, she was very angry and thought she could lay it on my sister. You want to know what a man could do with determination and raging hatred? I never set up an online presence, mainly because up to my 18th birthday, I was too poor to have a phone, and then the military taught me it wasn't needed. But for this special occasion, I made an exception. I created a Facebook account and befriended her. I didn't even have to pretend to be anyone, since old people apparently accept friend requests from anyone. She had this vibe where she'd show off her money and her vacations and her items like a wealthy person. From my mother and her trusty gossip circle, I knew that she always told whoever she owed money that she was struggling, so I figured she must be blocking them. The next part was easy. I just sent all of her selfies to everyone she's owing to. I didn't have to declare myself since I was literally on a throwaway account, so it's just really this long line of messages that showed my aunt spending her money lavishly. For the following month, she was threatened, not with legal actions like I did, but with much more sinister actions. She would have thugs, not the police, throw gifts at her door, like paint, fish sauce, and sometimes literal poop. My mother also told me this, of course. She finally figured out what I was going to do when I told her to find me a list of all these people she's owing. The pro revenge, as much as I want to take credit for this, the idea wasn't mine. My father's side of the family is this very traditional family where you would have a person acting as the head of family deciding things that matter. This was way before the war so obviously they don't do such things anymore, but the head of the family still has a certain voice. And there's this once in a year ceremony where we gather together to pay tribute to our ancestors. During the ceremony, the head of family will give a speech and then some announcements like who died, who got married, who gave birth. Then there will be a celebratory party where we basically get poop face drunk. My great grandfather was the head. He had three sons and two of them died during the war. So my grandfather took the mantle, then my father, and eventually me. This whole side of the family's in another town that's like three hours away from our town. Mainly because my grandfather didn't expect to be the head, so he moved out seeking opportunities. I found these gatherings redundant and unnecessary, but that year, I was actually looking forward to it. My father tried to keep the actual date hidden. It wasn't fixed, but generally somewhere between June. But he seriously underestimated my mother. She doesn't have a gossip circle. She has an infinite number of them. So my mother, me, and my sister's family all head back for it. The trip was 14 hours in total, but the result was worth it. We timed it so we would come two days earlier than my father, again thanks to her gossip circle. This side of the family never heard the full story before, only the version my father gave them, which was that he and my mother left in good faith. I actually gave my father some credits for not bad mouthing my mom. After weighing all the pros and cons, we decided to let my mother loose. 
and she's exceptional when it comes to relaying details about her personal tragedies. I kid you not, if I'd posted her story word for word, by this time next week there would be a global Justice for Thunderkirk's mother movement. It took just one day for everyone to know what a jerk my father had been. The look on his face when he arrived with my aunt and my grandmother and saw my family already there was priceless. He got the stink eye from everyone for the rest of the day. Nobody would initiate conversations with him, so he's just sitting there like a sad dog. Now I know what they said about dead horses, but this idea was brilliant not to follow through. My uncle, let's call him Oliver, came up with this. In the hierarchy, he's equal to my father, and in the event that my branch doesn't have a male successor, 100% what's going to happen, his branch will be the head of the family. He told me I should take up the mantle of the head. It was very sudden. I didn't have a speech ready. My father was supposed to do that, but Oliver told me I could just tell whatever I want because nobody really paid attention to that thing anyway. All the other elders were okay with it. His speech wasn't even the best thing. At the celebratory party, people were assigned tables based on the family tree. Heads of each branch will sit together, their children sit together, the elders sit together, so on and so forth. Because I was elevated to the head of my branch, I would be sitting at the big boy table. My father didn't even get to sit at that supposed table because, miraculously, it was full. Even though I could have sworn there weren't 20 of us and each table can sit up to 10, he had to sit at the regular table with my aunt and a bunch of nasty widows who didn't hold back on their snarky comments. So I was told. I don't think you'll ever come back to one of those anytime soon. The aftermath? My father now is just a miserable old man. His mistress left him because, surprisingly, she was after his money. He's living in our old house now with next to nothing. His retirement money, though halved, was good enough for him to live by. Last I heard, his cancer's come back. And obviously this time, my sister won't be paying for it anymore. He had tried to initiate contact with my mother, trying to make amends. We had to block his number and his profile on my mother's account because she actually considered it. She has her soft sides. My aunt has to sell her house to pay for all the debt, or else they just continue harassing her. She now lives in a small house she bought off with the rest of her money. I felt bad for her husband because he's actually quite chill and quite nice, but he's not the most decisive and therefore doesn't really confront her. I hope he's doing better. I have no empathy for her only son though. Let's just say the apple doesn't even fall from the tree. How do I know all this? My mother's gossip circle. I left my grandmother out of this because she's very old. She's not demented in any way, she's perfectly sane, but she loved her son too much to admit he's in the wrong. Also, she was very nice and sweet to me growing up. A lot of my good memories are with her. I'm sad because she doesn't see my mother in the same way. I also stopped talking to her and would only visit once during Lunar New Year. She's lived in the small house she and my grandfather built on the land that's now in my name. When she and my father pass, I'll carry out her wish to build an altar for her and my grandfather. Whether or not my father will be included is still up to debate. Frankly, I would say this almost goes beyond pro-revenge into nuclear revenge territory. This is like his entire life, his entire family, his entire status just gone, nuked, and forced to just resign to some barely making it by life in some small quiet house. Yeah, I'll take your shift. This was years ago. I was 16 working my first job at a pizza shop that had a whole thing based off of hot and ready pizzas. Yeah, that one. This was hands down the worst job I've ever had. Between crappy customers, God forbid they have to wait 5 minutes for a pepperoni pizza at 6pm on a Friday because we sold all of our ready pizzas, the even worse staff We were also understaffed, we had 12 people total working there, and needed like 4-5 to people per shift with 2-3 to shifts per day, and the lack of a management system. I only worked there for 3 months. In short, I was never bullied in school, but I was bullied by my co-workers at this job. I don't know if it's because I was the youngest and they were all 18-24, to I don't know, not my problem. They were all terrible to me, such as putting their tasks onto me because they didn't want to do it. I basically ran that shop at one point, leaving me to carry the heavy boxes of dough from the basement while they only carried toppings, forcing me to deal with the most difficult customers. They often referred to me as management despite being the youngest on there and not a manager, and blamed me for not doing tasks when the district manager would come to the store. Our store manager quit. 
Maybe he got fired, I don't know, like a month in, and they never replaced her. After three months of a toxic workplace and working every holiday from Halloween to New Year's and my entire winter break, I put in my two weeks. Realized I was 16 and way too young to be miserable at my job, so the schedule comes out and the one guy who was especially nasty to me realized I wasn't on the following week. He was like, darn, they really cut your hours. And I was like, no, I put in my two weeks. He smiles so big and then immediately tries to hide it. I then hear him go into the back and high five the other cook after telling him that I quit. Maybe an hour later, he gets a text and realizes that he was supposed to go to a family event or something on a Saturday he has to work all day. Again, we don't have a store manager, so the rule of thumb to get coverage was just ask the person and write their name on top of yours on the schedule in the office. No one's covering his shift, everyone's busy, so I offer to. I tell him I needed an extra bit of money anyways, even though I wasn't supposed to work that week and my next job doesn't start until the week after. He's so excited. The day comes and I just don't go. I don't know what happened. I don't care who I screwed over in the store. I don't care if he got in trouble. I just left it at that. After what that place put me through for three months, it was the least I could do for a peace of mind. If you worked at a place like this with a bunch of coworkers who were totally ungrateful, walked all over you, and you were on your way out with two weeks, Would you want to screw them on your way out too? Leave them with something to remember you by? Or would you rather just drop it and leave that in the past? Let me know what you would do in the comments down below. Our next story is from Jesse Lynx. I flipped off a class of elementary schoolers. So back when I had a motorized bike, I was just cruising through this upper class neighborhood minding my own business. The road I was on went right by this elementary school and right on the other side of the fence, there's a playground for the school. As I'm riding by, I hear shouting from the kids and get pelted with rocks. It didn't really hurt, but the little craps irritated me. I looped around the neighborhood and rode past the school again, just to see if they would do it again. Sure enough, I got pelted with rocks, and the kids were shouting words they shouldn't know at that age. They looked about third grade. Anyway, I swing around again, and as this time I'm coming up, I can see the group of kids all lined up with rocks in their hands, ready for me. As I passed them, I flipped the bird at them all, and I didn't get hit with a single rock. All the kids were shocked I would do such a thing. I specifically remember this little girl's jaw dropped in utter shock. I regret nothing. I don't know what's wrong with these kids, but they're growing up all kinds of wrong, standing there pelting passerbys with rocks. I had a situation growing up in school where cars were driving by. I didn't throw rocks at them. I could be a little bit of a jerk to my classmates, though. Our next story is from Lemon B 90 Ask us to tone it down? Okay, I'll clap even harder. I went to my mom's graduation yesterday. It was a large ceremony with all of the graduate students receiving degrees across the university. It was held in the basketball stadium. Lots of people, really loud, etc. I was with a group of four people, two of them being my siblings. Before the ceremony formally began, we were talking, like normal people, about mom and her degree, etc. I don't think we were particularly loud, and anyway, the whole stadium was loud. The graduates hadn't entered, and they hadn't played the national anthem. This older woman in the row in front of us turns and says to my brother in a really rude tone, Can you tone it down, please? My brother, who's a really gentle guy and very unobtrusive, who had just been talking about how he was happy for his mom finally getting her PhD, looked super embarrassed. My older sister was indignant. I, the middle child, was petty. You tell my baby brother to shut up when your whole group is still talking? Oh, heck no. Do you know how many times you clap at one of these things? Probably close to 50 times. I normally don't clap very hard. I have arthritis in my hands and clapping a lot or super hard makes them hurt, tingle, etc. So I typically do a white lady tennis clap. I was right behind this woman in tiny stadium seating. Every time it came for applause, I clapped so darn hard. Hands cupped, my chicken wing arms pumping, really loud, old man, encore please, best darn joke I ever heard of my life, claps right behind her head. I made sure I didn't clap the longest, but almost. After the first few, my hands started to tingle and ache, but my mama didn't raise a quitter. I think halfway through the ceremony, she realized what was happening. She talked to the person next to her and gestured towards me, so I stopped for about 10 minutes. 
letting some thunderous applause go by with only a few polite claps, only to start up again even harder. And you bet when mom was on stage, I was screaming and hootering and hollering. Are my hands sore today? Yes, but if I knew where the lady lived, I'd go clap outside her bedroom window. I just don't understand where this lady's trying to get off trying to tell people to stop talking. And you're in stadium seating. Like, if there's ever going to be a place where there's talking, it's going to be an open stadium. This ain't the movie theater, Karen. Stop your whining and turn back around and save your poor spine. Our next story is from Alligator5432. Keep me up all night? Fine, we're all waking up early. I live in an apartment building on the ground floor. I have a corner unit, so I share one wall with one unit, my upstairs neighbors. The unit above me has a constant stream of subletters that cycle in and out about once a month. The current occupants are a nightmare. They party and scream and stomp around until 2 to 3 a.m. multiple times a week. After the first few nights of this, I hit a breaking point and decided all of our butts are waking up early. I try to keep my home workouts quiet, using headphones and staying away from my noisier equipment until the afternoon. But my 5 a.m. alarm now is the bullhorn hooked to my beat speaker. My music is now boosted bass dubstep and my loud bike trainer is my warm up. Enjoy the hangover, jerks. I'm just thinking of that darn video of that lady with the pans in the hallway, singing the lovely tune of Ain't Get No Sleep Cause of Y'all. If your apartment neighbor has no consideration for keeping it down, they're gonna party all night, then you can party all morning too with OP. Wake up and get that workout in. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every single video has great stories, like our next one from Motor City Wings 20, Narcissistic workers slandered me to get bonus points from the boss when I first started and really hurt my reputation, so I did the same. A coworker really hurt my reputation by telling my boss and my coworkers that I had no work ethic and I just lug around and I don't do much, despite actually really working pretty hard. He did this a lot to the point where I had to work my butt off beyond belief to the point that my bosses had to notice so that I could keep my job. After this held up for a while, this tool actually printed an email he sent to my boss expecting me to give him praise saying that I improved my work ethic, despite discrediting me working my butt off on a daily basis. He's always been into power and praise, so he's tried to get into policing and firefighting for years, but never gotten in. Him slandering me costed me promotions and securing a full-time position and ultimately scarred my reputation. I believe that he just thought I was an easy target because I was new and he had nothing to lose from crap talking me. He finally got a volunteer job in firefighting. He's going around boasting that he's a firefighter and carries his walkie talkie around off duty and despite being there for like a couple months, says he's going to be hired full time. What are the odds that several of my friend's dads are longtime firefighters at the hall he works out of? I ask them if they know my coworker and of course they do. How much they must love him given that he says he'll be full time in a month and the one time they printed off an email he gave to my boss telling him i really improved my work ethic they all think he's a tool and they don't know where he got the idea they'll be hiring him be careful who you target at work buddy you gotta admit the world is a small world indeed sometimes and somebody you might pick on might have some serious connections that you're just not aware about I wouldn't say that this should serve as a lesson as to why they should treat people with respect. Obviously, just regardless, they should treat people with respect and treat people the way they deserve without bias, without trying to throw somebody under the bus and bully them really for no reason. Like, what is the point of calling OP lazy or having no work ethic and just lugging around? Are they just doing it to try to make themselves look better in comparison to supposedly not doing much at all? Our next story is from Chadgar honking me to get in the car faster? Now wait. About 10 years ago, I went out to lunch with a coworker. When we were done with lunch and getting back into his car, he asked me to wait a second before getting in so he could shuffle some things around. I had the door open and was standing in an open parking spot. As he was doing this, a car drove up to the spot and immediately honked at me and motioned for me to get out of the way. That rubbed me the wrong way because it's not like I was just standing there for fun. It should have been obvious I was about to get in the car, but to just honk without even waiting a second or two to see what was going on? Screw you. 
About five seconds later, he had cleared whatever needed to be cleared and told me I could get in. But I told him to wait. I stood in the open parking space and stared at the driver. She honked and honked. I just stood there. After about a minute of this, she admitted defeat and went to go park somewhere else. As she did, I got in the car and we drove off. The spot she ended up with was more cramped and further away. All she had to do was give me a few seconds to get in the car, but no, she had to get aggressive right away. Oh well, I hope you enjoyed waiting extra and getting a crappy space on top of it. Yeah, I don't know who this lady was, but you're not going to inspire too many people to want to help you out. You're going to roll up to the parking spot. Just waiting there is already kind of a little irritating. But to sit there and keep honking and honking, I'd want to go and sit down in that car, put the seat back, kick my feet up. Maybe I'll take a quick five minute siesta and just really take in the nice, peaceful sounds of honk, 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 honk. Our next story is from Zellas. Check, please. This is not a new type of story, but wanted to share it nonetheless. I'm sure some of you have been in my shoes. On this glorious day, my friends and I decided to get together and go out to dinner. We were away from home for months, working, and it was one of those, we're all off tonight, let's go out moments. This group was maybe 8 to 10 people, I can't remember exactly how many. All really good friends, the type you trust and vibe with. Surprisingly, everyone decided to go to Outback Steakhouse. It was close and they said the food's not terribly bad. No big deal. We were out to release some stress, laugh a lot, eat and drink. Everyone that's worked the service industry knows how large groups can get. I've worked the service industry as a waiter in the past, so I know how rough things can be. However, I was with a good crew and I had no concerns with things getting out of hand. It was maybe 8 p.m. We were immediately seated because someone had called to let the restaurant know we were a decent sized group. We waited and waited and waited for the waitress. I'd say a solid 10 minutes. I walk up to the hostess and say, hey, we've been waiting for our waiter or waitress. Can you please send someone over? Five more minutes, our waitress comes. Y'all ready to order? At this point, we're all like, cool, no big deal. Let's order some food and have a good time. I tell the waitress, at the end, please bring me one check. I'll take care of it. Because like I said, Anything I can do to help a waiter or waitress, I'll do. I've been there. I know how that can make or break a long night. Not because anyone at the table wasn't financially able to, but usually one person pays the bill and others either drop cash to the payer or they got me tomorrow. Whatever, we'll easily figure it out. But usually one person pays for the sake of helping the waitress out. We order appetizers and drinks. Ten minutes go by. No waitress, no drinks. The appetizers arrive, some of them, and our waitress is nowhere to be found. Now things are starting to go downhill in terms of expectations and a good dining experience. Our waitress comes back smelling like, I'd say the distinct smell of a green leafy substance that may or may not be illegal in some states, aka marijuana. No big deal, you do you boo, I'm not judging, but I'm getting annoyed. The drink orders are wrong, they're taking forever, the whole nine yards. Some people still don't have apps, you get it. At this point I suggest to everyone we order everything at once. However many drinks you think you'll want, main course, dessert, we need to ensure we get food sometime before Christmas. This way the waitress at least puts them in the system and we hopefully get our food and drinks at once. The food and drinks take forever to arrive. Surprisingly the food orders were correct. However, we were still missing some appetizers and drinks. We eat, continue to have a good time and so forth. When the waitress brought the check, I told the waitress I was no longer paying the check and she needed to bring separate checks. She said, how many ways should I split the check? And one of my female friends responded, oh no boo boo, we all need separate checks tonight. At this point, everyone still had drinks and dessert, so it was game the freak on. I got my check back and said I never got my appetizer, yet it's on my check. She ran off and came back with a new check. I said, you charged me for three drinks, I only received two. New check. I said, my friend over here never received his drink or appetizer, but they're on his check. He needs another check. New check. I said, excuse me, my girlfriend, my friend but she played along, has the wrong check. You mixed up her appetizer with someone else's. Everything else is correct. Two new checks. 
and every time she came back, there was something that required a new check. This went on until some of the staff were literally walking out while we were still there, drinking, eating, and waiting for our check. We could have went on all night, but had to call it a night. But not before asking for some change for a $100 bill, because someone decided to pay with cash for their check. I could have just paid one check, but screw that. Blood had to be shed. Listen, I'm not gonna lie, like, I'm not a very big judgmental person. If you're gonna go and, you know, smoke a little of the green leafy substance while you're on the clock, it doesn't really bother me, as long as it's not affecting my service. But yeah, if I'm sitting there waiting 10 plus minutes each time I order or wait for you, and then you're getting the order wrong on top of that and the bill's wrong, then I'm gonna be livid and also I'm gonna be pretty incentivized to give no tip. If you had a waiter or waitress do this bad, do you think it's ethical to not give a tip or do you think you should always give some kind of tip? Let me know what you guys think in the comments. This next story is from Acceptable Site. Two can play this game. This is not the most petty I've ever been, but it is the most recent as it's happening right now. A mildly annoying thing that my husband will do is if he goes to bed before me is clear off his side of the bed and anything that's mine he'll put on my side of the bed. Like, on it, so I have to move it before getting to lay down. This is annoying for a couple of reasons. One, he's literally taking the time to take his stuff off the bed. We're not the neatest of people, he's just piling it in a corner. So he could plop my stuff there too. Two, when I clean off the bed, I take everything off because I recognize that we both will be getting into bed eventually. Three, when I come to bed super late, it's because I'm ready to fall asleep, not suddenly have to clean up stuff and I use that mindset when clearing the bed and taking his stuff off. So the petty revenge, if he couldn't see where this is going, tonight I'm going to bed first. And he has a ton of clothes folded across the bed. None were mine, so I just put them on his side, turned out the lights, and I'm going to bed once I make a stupid reddit post. I doubt anything worthy of an update will happen and I don't expect it to suddenly cause him to clear off the bed completely, but I feel petty tonight so yeah. He can see how it feels to be tired and ready to fall on the mattress and have to pick up stuff first. Update: I honestly don't know if I should laugh or pull my hair out. The universe just played a huge, ha ha, screw your petty butt card. I'm laying in bed, lights are off, I'm starting to doze off, and my husband comes in to ask when I'm taking the dog out. Why is he asking? Because we take turns every other night taking her out because we don't have a yard, and bicker about who will do it if we don't fairly alternate it. And because he came into the room to ask about it, he saw the clothes and just put them in the corner I mentioned. No issue. Oh, and to top it off, He freaking offered to walk the dog since I was already in bed and almost asleep. I'm not petty often, I'm really not, and the one night I decide to be petty, it fails horribly. He actually missed a binder near his pillow, and I feel bad enough to go ahead and move it for him. What the heck, universe? What the heck? You gotta love that you gotta buckle down and finally go for that petty revenge, and the moment you do, they end up being like a sweetheart, silently moving the stuff off, saying... Don't worry, I'll take out the dog tonight. And just making you feel like a little bit of a jerk for trying to get some, honestly, I think fair petty revenge. I don't think OP should let this one go. And the next time it happens, just keep it up and see if they complain about it. Or maybe you end up in a loop where only you're getting upset about moving the stuff. This next story is from M4 Taylor. We are brothers. So when I grew up, I had about five other siblings in different ages, and I was a half-brother to all of them. Anyway, my oldest brother hated me growing up, mostly because everyone kept saying I was an identical copy of our dad, someone brother and I looked up to. He bullied me pretty hard, stole my Lego sets, broke buildings and cars and so on when I was a wee kid. When I got older, I was told by mutual acquaintances he had spread the rumor I was gay. And such rumors at the school. This was the mid-90s, not even near the tolerance we have now. I had the fortune of a closer aged brother who looked out for me, but since he was two years older, the last few years, every school term was like a living heck. Anyway, our dad died, and we had a falling out that was pretty harsh. We ended up fighting after the funeral, after our aunt said I'd be keeping the memory alive, and my brother flipped out. I'm no saint, but I try not to fight that much or cause people to fly off their handles, and try to downplay what she said, like I did most of my life. So, we didn't speak for years. 
I got a notification a month or so ago about him having some financial issues and calling our other siblings for help and advice, not asking for money but nearly there. So I did what any good little brother would, I sent him what would be about $5,000 and a note stating, no matter what, we are brothers. If you send this back, I'll send double. Knowing my prideful brother, not ever wanting any help or money, I know how much that would either piss him off or he'd be thankful enough to leave me alone. I'm told he told our sister about it, asking what my plan was and she replied, that's just our little brother. I don't plan to ask for anything back or an apology or anything, it's just knowing that despite anything, we are brothers and the fact that he's gonna hate it and won't be able to act on it that gives me a satisfaction on this revenge. And I'm pretty sure my other siblings know I'm spite donating, but considering they know our history, they don't care. I also know being more well off than him, thankfully with a working wife and proper and safe job, is something that grinds his gears. Not the best revenge or conventional, but meh, it's something that isn't illegal or punching someone a head taller than me. This is definitely a really interesting form of petty revenge. There's like multiple layers of satisfaction that OP really can get out of this, which is knowing that I'm sure that amount of money is really going to be helping their sibling. So you just kind of feel a little bit better knowing you help them, you know, get back on their feet. But also knowing that there is no way, despite them being nasty to you for years, that they can say anything that they'd really want to say to you. Because what leg do they have to stand on in saying anything like that when you just gave them $5,000? In a weird way, it's like satisfying for OP that it might eat away at the brother a bit. Maybe it'll make the brother realize they were a jerk for acting the way they did to OP for all those years. Our next story is from Friggin' Way. Enjoy that CDRW. Early 2000s, I worked as customer service for Dell. I helped customers correct any issues after they had just received their new computer. Missing monitor, wrong upgrade, broken and need replacement, refund charges, etc. This was also during the time that Dell was switching from beige computers to black computers. Important for later, guy calls in one day and says that the new computer he received is not what he ordered through his salesperson. I pull up his account and instantly I can see he's lying and knew this was going to be a fun call. You see, when ordering from Dell, you either ordered through a salesperson or on the website, and the system can tell us which you ordered from. He ordered through the website. Doing my best to not call him a liar straight out of the gate, I say, Sir, I actually see you placed your order through our website. However, what seems to be the issue with your computer? I ordered a CDRW, but I only got a CD-ROM drive. You need to send me out a CDRW, and I'm not paying anything extra. I checked his online order, and sure enough, he had selected CD-ROM. Now, being an online order, what you select to order is what you're charged and receive. If I remember correctly, the difference between CD-ROM drives and CD-RW at the time was like 50 bucks. Nothing huge, but still. We used to have some issues with salespeople, where they would tell customers they're getting better components, but only order and charge the lower end parts just to make a sale and get that commission. This makes the customer think they got a great deal on a new computer, only later to realize it's not as great a deal as they thought. Times like those, I'd be more than willing to send out a free CDRW upgrade to smooth over the problems and keep the customer happy. But he placed his order online. He'll get no love from me today. I'm sorry sir, since you placed your order online and you chose the CD-ROM, I would have to charge you for the CDRW. They say, no, I ordered and paid for the CDRW, you will send me the CDRW. At this point, I could have argued back and forth with him, at which point he'd probably ask for my manager, and of course my manager would give in and just give him the CDRW, but my shift was ending in a few minutes, and I needed this call done. Looking at his order, I see that he'd ordered the newer black computer. I then pull up my list of computer parts, and order him a beige CDRW. Okay sir, I've ordered your replacement CDRW at no cost. It'll arrive in 3-5 to five days, and you'll need to send the old CD-ROM back. Thank you for choosing Dell. This is kind of a fun hypothetical to think about for your position. If you were this customer, and let's say you actually did get screwed over on the CDRW drive, if you called up and complained and got a free one sent out to you, 
but it ended up being the wrong color, it didn't match the case of your computer, would that upset you to no end? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Pine Trees 1990 stopped my ex-boss from getting a promotion. So I'd worked really hard to get a job I loved and I was great at and paid decent. My team loved me and everything was going great. I made the stupid decision to change departments. It was the same job, but this department paid 5% more. I went to my first meeting in the new job and knew I had made a mistake. The operations manager made someone cry. There were only five of us in the meeting, and he was picking on a junior manager who had made a small mistake on the wording and a presentation he was doing. The rest of the team was great. While I was there, I was the lead for a big project that lasted for two years. I managed everything and was the go-to person. On the final meeting with the director, my boss took over and took credit for all my hard work. So I left the department and started to work somewhere else in the same company. About six months later, boss rings me in a panic and explains he has a big interview but can't find the project pack. I say I'll send it across. I dig out the pack but put in a roles and responsibilities page before I send it across. I had my name as lead on pretty much everything. I get a call later on from an old coworker who said boss had gone to his interview, explained he ran this project, did X, Y, and Z, and then went to go through the pack which had the responsibilities and he looked like an idiot, which rattled him and impacted the rest of his interview. Boss was fuming, but my coworker had backed me up. Boss didn't end up getting the promotion, and I like to think I played a small part of that. I don't see how you can feel bad in any way for a guy like this, who went and made a fool of himself in an interview trying to fluff himself up, trying to make him look way more important and smart and bright and a leader, all the while just trying to bite off the work OP did. Good on OP for not letting them get away with that. Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. We've got a lot of crazy stories today, so let's get right into it. Our first story of the day is from Telegraph Onyx. A coworker intentionally ripped me off, so I tracked them down, publicly outed them, humiliated them, and created a major spectacle busting them to take back my property. I went to work recently, and I had a really hard night. I work in a very demanding industry with the general public. At work, sometimes people are very difficult, and that particular night, I was assaulted by a guest. It was a very difficult night and ended with a police response, which was humiliating to me, that I needed help from an armed officer. I was embarrassed about it. When it was all said and done, I clocked out and I left work. And when I got to the transit center, I went to check my phone for the time so I could see how long my wait would be. I discovered my phone was gone. I was upset because I knew I had to go back to the facility to search for it with some OPS guys who would need to bring a flashlight so we could look into some nook and cranny. That took over an hour. After not finding it, as it wasn't turned in at command or in our office, I left. I traveled home and was very disappointed. I would gotten my butt kicked and then somehow my phone came up missing. I then retraced my steps and realized that the last time I remember having my phone was in the employee area prior to clocking out. So it hit me that my phone had come up missing from an employee only area as staff have a separate entrance from guests. I then felt pissed off and determined. It hit me that after I got beat up at work by some wild woolly mammoth, one of my own coworkers ripped me off. I regretted not installing a phone tracking app in my phone. It was a cheap phone, but it was mine, and it was full of my contacts and login access and banking info, etc, etc. Pictures of the baby. I wanted it back. Not having it was going to make my life harder. At that point, it hit me that all the apps on my phone were probably tracking my phone, and so I wondered if there was any way I could track the phone from my laptop at home. After an hour or so of research and reading, and trying various tracking methods, I discovered that my Google account was logged in on both devices, so I could open the Google account on my laptop and go in and see the location of the other device logged into my Google account. To my surprise, the locator showed a pin on an apartment building not too far from me, less than a mile away to be exact. I felt adrenaline, I felt exhilarated. I was determined to get my phone back. I called the police and was told that they couldn't deal with it until business hours the next day. I then waited until the crack of dawn and went over to this nearby building where I tracked my phone to after business hours started to check it out. It was a fourplex apartment building, very small. 
A lady saw me looking at the mailbox and she came out to talk to me. I told her I was looking for the employee of a certain facility that lived there and she confirmed that someone who works at our facility did live there. She asked me why I didn't know their name and I said I was there tracking my phone that they had. She immediately perked up and was in a hurry to take me up there. She gave me the vibe that she didn't care for that tenant and was more than happy to help. I went up and called the police from the welcome mat of the apartment my phone was in to let them know I had arrived as advised. I made the call very loudly so the phone thief would hear and know that they were cornered. I was putting the pressure on. A little leverage. The door to the apartment behind me opened up then and the thief's neighbor peered out at me curiously. I smiled and said, Hi, I work at X facility. Someone who works there stole my phone from the employee's only lounge. I tracked it here with an app. Our facility is a little prestigious and my job kind of comes with some swag. So this lady smiled a small smile and she looked almost smug and she then nodded at me and said, all right, and closed the door quietly with a smirk. I had a feeling she didn't like the neighbor either. Then I applied more pressure. I knocked on the door about 20 times loudly. I shouted that I was an employee of X facility and that another employee had stolen my phone, but I'd tracked it there. Neighbors had confirmed that an employee of the facility lived there in that unit and the cops were on the way, so send it out. The door swung open, a strange older woman I'd never seen before came to the door and handed it out to me. She looked scared and angry. I had a feeling she wasn't the thief, but that they lived with her. She had a pissed off mom vibe. I went down and told the woman who helped me and brought me in that I'd gotten my phone back. I thanked her and left. Then on the way out, I photographed all the names on the mailbox for that unit. It was a fourplex and one unit was vacant. So I'd managed to inform both the phone thief's neighbors that they were a dishonest neighbor. I could tell too that there was pleasure for them in my revenge. It was a loud, bold revenge. On the way home, I felt pretty satisfied with myself. I was savoring my victory. My housemates were impressed. I had used a tracker to find my phone and taken it back from the thief while bringing them a public shaming. Then I sent a note to my accounts manager and HR describing the situation. Command knew that I was searching for the phone when I left. Ops and security guys had tried to help me find it, so everyone knew it was missing. I told them I had evidence as to where the phone had been tracked to in my device location history. Then I sent the address of my coworker and a screenshot of all the names on the mailbox, one which looked familiar as if I'd seen it on a company badge. At that point, the next few times I worked, I waited until people were gathered around me in the employee locker room to tell my tale telling each group of workers what happened and what I did about it. Then I told them to look out for that particular name on another worker's badge. Everyone said, yeah, they worked with somebody with that name before. That's who stole my phone after I got beat up that night at work. Yeah, everyone laughed and laughed. I can only imagine that the thief will never steal another phone again so long as they live for fear that the owner will track them like a dog to take their property back and publicly shame them. I still smile to think about it. It was a revenge to save her. If you lost your phone or you knew that somebody stole your phone and you were able to track the address, would you be willing to physically go there or would you try desperately to get the police to help? Let me know in the comments down below if you would dare go out searching on your own for that phone's location. Our next story is from Whisperly, Revenge Sushi 1, Mac and Cheese 0. I'm a 40 year old female. My partner, 40 year old male, does most of the cooking. I do other tasks around the house, like cleaning the bathrooms and fixing stuff. We don't always eat together or the same meal because we work different hours and we enjoy the freedom of eating what we want. So sometimes he'll make cauliflower for one, his fave but I'm not a fan, and I'll make a salad. Tonight he wanted to make mac and cheese for the both of us. Then we have this text convo with me saying, yum, we're out of cheese, can you get some on your way home? He says, we still have cheese in the fridge. I say, nope, I checked and we're out. He says, are you sure? Please note, I was working from home, which he knew, and physically checking the fridge. I wasn't just guessing that we were out, hence saying I checked. He does this all the time. He's not a mansplainer, but he's very insecure, I guess. And he's 100% a man questioner. I dislike it because one, please just believe what I tell you. Two, all these questions are making me double guess myself. I've straight up told him that, like... We've had that discussion many times. 
This time, rather than assure him, yes, I'm sure, I just stop replying. If he thinks that we have some imaginary cheese left over in the fridge, fine, he can use that for the mac and cheese. Meanwhile, I know we're out of cheese, so, and here's where I may have been the jerk, I place an order for sushi for one. Partner gets home, checks the fridge, surprise, we're out of cheese. He proposes to make noodles instead, and I tell him to go ahead and cook for one because I'll eat something else. He makes the noodles, sits down to eat, and the delivery guy shows up with my petty revenge sushi, which was delicious by the way. This is definitely one of those situations where maybe it's okay for OP to keep doing this thing until hopefully their partner understands if OP's saying that we're out of something, that means they're out of something, they're not just guessing. It's definitely more on the petty side, but I understand being frustrated from that. Our next story is from Chaotic for King Good. Food thief will never steal someone's lunch again. I worked in an office where there was a break room food thief who would not quit no matter how many angry meetings were held about it. For some reason, the thief really liked my sandwiches, so one day I finally had enough and I liberally doused my sandwich with the most ridiculously top Scoville rated hot sauce that I could find. Like so hot that the reviews from people who loved really spicy things were saying that they couldn't handle it. The thief didn't think anything was wrong because I often put hot sauce on my sandwiches. We found out who the thief was really fast because all of a sudden, an employee who I knew did not like me started yelling, oh my god, again and again and trying to drink a million glasses of water. They never stole a lunch again. I definitely love revenge stories like this, but I'm kind of feeling a little left short. I want to know if people called them out on it, like, obviously you know who did it because of that reaction, but did you guys point it out? Did you yell at them? Did you say, guess we know who the food thief is? By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. They're chocked full of awesome stories like our next one from OK Outlandishness 1363. He's not my boss, sir. For a while, I worked for an agency that assists low-income households with energy and gas for a flat rate. I assisted with applications over the phone for people who had trouble navigating the website. This story takes place about six months after I was hired. For the sake of the story, Bam is bad butt manager, ED is the entitled jerk, and me, obviously. All of the employees are currently working from home at the time. It's 9.12 a.m. and my phone starts ringing off the hook. I answer and the following ensues. I say, good morning, Wax and J Assistance Office. My name's Emily. How can I assist you today? Entitled Jerk says, yeah, Emily. Hello. Finally, God, I hope they don't pay you to be lazy like that every day. The phones don't typically open until 9.15 a.m. So I'm being nice by answering. I say, great, so what can I help you with? They say, yeah, I was filling out my application with Richard. He's not my boss. He's a guy that does the same thing I do every day at work. They say, he's probably your boss, but I doubt you know him. I lost connection and have tried calling for three days straight after my call on Friday was dropped. I say, I can actually assist you with that application right now. If you could give me your first and last name, I can pull it up. They say, listen here, you dumb brat. I want to talk to Richard. He's your boss. Let me talk to your freaking boss of the entire company. I'm going to have Richard fire your lazy butt. I say, oh yes, of course, sir. Let me transfer you to our district manager. The entitled jerk to someone in the background says, see, I told you Richard was the manager. Obviously, women can't handle things like this. I put him on hold and do a warm transfer to our district manager who is a single mom who works 60 plus hours a week helping people to be able to afford electricity and heating services. I give her the rundown and I could picture her face go from zero to Yzma in 0.2 seconds. She lets me know after the call that the guy made almost $250,000 a year. They really wanted to take from people who can't afford basic necessities of life to save a couple hundred dollars a month. He was blacklisted, and she called around to other state agencies to let them know to be on the lookout for him. He did file a complaint against Richard. Why, though? I think we'll never know. You gotta love all the check boxes a person like this checks off. Total jerk? Wants to steal from the poor? Wants to save money that is almost meaningless to somebody who makes as much as they do? You gotta love that they're willing to spend that much time and get that stressed out just to pinch their pennies a little bit more. 
Our next story is also from Chaotic for King Good. Treat the wait staff badly. Enjoy your birthday song. I used to work in a popular Italian chain restaurant and we gave free chocolate cake for birthdays. Especially on Fridays and Saturdays, we had tons of them. If you weren't a jerk as a customer, the person who sang happy birthday to you was me. I was a singer at the time and had the best voice in the crew. Note, I am not saying that I was Beyonce or anything, but if you were a jerk, you got Jose. Not only was Jose a really bad singer, but he would purposely make his performance even worse. He knew he was a bad singer and thought it was funny, so he was fine with it. Everyone, especially me and Jose, got a massive kick out of watching the awful customers' faces when they heard Jose sing. It was priceless. Happy birthday to you. Oh boy, what a joy. To be fair though, the amount of people that go to these places and say it's their birthday for the free chocolate cake, I wonder how many of them actually are celebrating their birthday. Like, I think it's more common to hear about people pretending to say it's their birthday for the free chocolate cake, or saying that it's their friend's birthday as like a prank, than it is to hear about people actually just asking for it. Our next story is from Languid Bot. Sketchy landlord learns expensive lesson. I wasn't the tenant in the story, but it was a former roommate of mine, and I had a front row seat to the events. So my friend, let's call them Paul, returned to my city after living out of state for a year or so. He needed a place to stay while he got himself set up with a job and a new apartment. I had a spare bedroom, so I offered it to him for a cheap price. That way, he could be month to month and just move out when he was ready. He probably stayed with me about six months, found a new job, saved up some cash, and signed a lease on a new apartment. Everything seemed fine. Paul liked his new studio apartment in a large apartment building. He wasn't far from work, near transportation, and in an area where he had other friends. Great. He got all moved in and seemed to be set. Until he realized the apartment had bed bugs. He wasn't there a week before he started finding bed bugs and bed bug bites, of course. So he did what anyone would do. He contacted the landlord's office to report the problem and ask about solutions. The office claimed that they had no other reports of bed bugs. They had no idea what he was talking about. Maybe he already had bed bugs when he moved in. You get the idea. Well, Paul knew they were lying, so he started talking to his neighbors on the corridor. And of course, he found others were also dealing with bed bugs, and that the landlord had given them the same BS responses. So Paul decided to do a bit of research to see what options the tenants had. Turns out, they could easily report the problem to the city inspectors, and the more reports they got from the same address, the more likely they were to prioritize sending someone to inspect the building. Paul put together the info for reporting with suggestions for what to mention and asked his neighbors to make reports. Some of them must have followed through because it wasn't long before Paul was contacted about the issue. He had bagged up all of his stuff and returned to my house but still had the lease and keys for his place. He met the inspector at the building and showed her his apartment. It was clearly infested and there were signs in the hallway. The inspector turned out to be a young woman who was very dedicated to her job. She told the landlord it was their responsibility to cure the infestation. The landlord wanted to bring in his usual exterminator to treat the apartment and hallway. They tried that, but it didn't fix the issue. The inspector eventually insisted that they tear out the carpet and sections of flooring where the infestation seemed to be centered. By now, the inspector had seen that multiple units were affected, so the costs were mounting. She also discovered that the building hadn't had a proper inspection in years. The landlord was dodging her and didn't want to set up a time for her to do a full inspection, of course. Well, after he negotiated to get out of his lease, Paul gave the inspector the punch code to the front door and pointed out several things that he thought the landlord was hiding, including bed bugs on other floors, malfunctioning elevator, old fire extinguishers, illegal basement level units, improperly stored building supplies, tripping hazard floor and laundry room, damaged walls and corridors. The inspector called Paul and let him know that she'd returned to the building on a couple of occasions. Once she was meeting the building manager, she let herself in a little early and walked up on the manager trash-talking her and saying how he didn't want to be bothered. The family-owned firm that owned that building had several large apartment buildings in the area, and the inspector intended to visit them all. 
she had already found tens of thousands in repairs for Paul's building that she was insisting the owner make ASAP. Given how they were operating, I'm sure all of their buildings were in a similar state. They made an expensive mistake when they tried to ignore Paul. Yeah, it's definitely one thing if the new tenant introduced the bed bugs, but uh, no remorse for a landlord that gets handed thousands of dollars in charges after they had gone and tried to not only mislead OP, but multiple other people that had to just deal with these bed bugs until they could finally group together. This next story is from Dry Mastodon 7574 using my petty powers for good. My college roommate became incredibly homesick and left school about halfway through. We still kept in touch. Some years after graduation, she asked me to be a bridesmaid and I was thrilled. I didn't know anyone else in the party and they didn't know me. The week of the wedding, the best man's girlfriend insinuated herself into the wedding party. She's one of those people who act so badly that no one knows what to say and people will do anything to avoid her. You know this kind of person. Again, she wasn't engaged to the best man, but just figured they'd get married. So she followed the bride around and criticized the wedding by comparing it to her imaginary wedding, which of course would be grander. You're getting married in this banquet hall? I'm going to have a wedding on the beach. It's going to be so much better. It was death of a thousand paper cuts. Subtle enough that no one could figure out how to step in and obnoxious enough to drive the bride crazy. The groom kept intervening, redirecting her, if not completely questioning why she was there, but he also had things to do. The best man seemed embarrassed into silence. This is what you need to know about me. One, I live in New York City. Two, my fiance had just started law school. Three, I'm obsessed with Fifth Avenue, but no, I don't shop there. Four, I can come off as the Duchess of Essex even in secondhand clothes. It was a few days before the wedding, we were setting up and partying. When I walk in, the bride tells me how the girlfriend was driving her nuts. I ask the bridge to show me all the plans. As we go through what's happening, the girlfriend's still doing her BS. But now, everything the bride shows me is tasteful and suits her and everything the girlfriend interjects is quaint and popular. Of course, I say it with such disdain. White roses are so classic. A friend of mine had a wedding at the plaza and it had white roses everywhere. Oh, silver roses? That's a bit expensive. Most people just use them in an attempt to be impressive. Now, I had just gotten engaged and hadn't started planning, but my imaginary wedding was going to be spectacular. By this time, the bride realized what I was up to and kept goading me to share the details of my wedding, but I kept shying away. Eventually, the girlfriend begged me to share, so I did. My Tanzanite engagement ring came from Tiffany's. I was having a very small destination wedding at a vineyard in Tuscany where my fiancé proposed to me. I haven't decided on a designer for my dress, but I promised the bride that she would come to the fitting at Bergdorf Goodman's when that happened. The girlfriend was completely demoralized. Suddenly, her beach wedding didn't seem so fancy, and slowly she faded into the background. Two days later, the wedding was gorgeous, the bride and groom happy. A month after that, the best man broke up with the girlfriend. I had a modest, affordable wedding, but for a brief moment, I was a rich heiress getting married in Tuscany. It was fun. Sometimes you gotta humble some people, and if that means you gotta put on a mask and just make sure that they know there's always a bigger fish out there, then so be it. Especially when it makes somebody that's just overly annoying and suggestive just kind of pipe down back to where they should be. Our next story is from Creative Fun 228 You should smile more. This is not one of those I waited on this revenge for years story, but rather one of those that makes your day a little better. My job is very strict and professional and practically requires a poker face, but my poker face often looks like a resting witch face. Through five years of my job almost every other day, I get that freaking, you should smile more sentence. I would politely say that we're not doing anything funny right now and proceed with my job. While they insist, even though we aren't doing anything funny, it doesn't hurt to smile. I just don't reply to that, wrap up my job and greet away. Today was the last straw that broke the camel's back. Another one rolls up, I feel his looks on me while I was scanning his documents, and he goes, did someone make you mad? I don't reply, and he still insists, why aren't you smiling? 
I say my usual line and he still pushes it and I snapped and said, my grandmother died. Do I still have to smile for you? I could see how he started to blush and then he started to stutter like, oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. My regrets, yada, yada. I just shrugged him off by telling him, next time you'll probably think before you tell someone to smile for you. Of course, my granny didn't die. I didn't even meet my grandmother's. But I hope he learned a lesson that not every female in the world is willing to smile to him just because he said so. Next one who says that to me will get, no, I don't think I will smile. Smiling gives wrinkles. As somebody that just has a naturally like sad looking face, I really resonate with this because there's times where like back in high school during like gym class, I might be sitting off to the side just chilling and just because of the way I look, I'll have people asking me, hey, are you okay? Are you sad? Or is everything all right? Uh, yeah, everything's fine. There were times where like I wasn't sad, but after the interaction, it almost made me sad because the people would be like, you look like you need a hug. And I would just be sitting there like, uh, okay. In my mind, I'm like, Nothing's happening and I'm completely fine. Our next story is from Spinifex. Petty but oh so rewarding, revenge on my snooze button hitting wife. My darling princess wife, the absolute love of my life, hates getting up in the morning. She is, by her own admission, not a morning person. Each and every morning when her alarm on her phone goes off, she hits snooze over and freaking over again. I've asked her several times to just get out of bed on the first alarm and be done with it. I've asked her to change the time that the alarm goes off if she wants to sleep late. She apologizes and promises to change her behavior. She complies for a while but soon reverts to the snooze button monster. So now when I get up in the night to have a pee, I'm old, it happens, and it'll happen to you too, I move her phone away from her bedside table. Sometimes I put it in the end suite, sometimes I put it in the cupboard, sometimes I put it under the bed, sometimes I put it in another room. Now when her alarm goes off, she has to get out of that bed to find that screeching incessant dream breaker. She knows that it was me, she knows that this is petty revenge for disturbing my sleep unnecessarily, and so I lie in bed all nice and smug. It's a very good thing that she still loves me. To be fair, I definitely feel bad for OP. I am awful with alarms. I will set multiple alarms so I can wake up and have that moment where it's like, oh, I still have an hour left. And I think that's just only helped me get more used to going back to sleep after the alarm goes off. I also love taking the chance of being five minutes more, okay, five minutes more, snooze, snooze, snooze. If there's one thing that I need to change about myself, it's definitely getting up when an alarm goes off. And our final story of the day is by Seesaw Mundane 5422 Petty revenge at the airport COVID testing station. Girlfriend and I just got back from a lovely trip to Italy. This isn't my revenge, but it was a pleasure to witness. Flying back to the US and probably some other countries still requires a negative COVID test. Girlfriend's good about thinking through details, and she pointed out that we can get our COVID test the day before the flight and avoid stress the morning of. I scout out the airport in Rome about 3 in the afternoon, and the on-site testing is pretty empty. So I grab her from the hotel and we go over. Unfortunately, when we get there, it's no longer quite so empty. There's a large group of very loud men, like 10 to 15 of them all in line ahead of us. The check-in staff is doing fine, but you can just feel the waves of tension rolling through the air. My girlfriend and I are fine. I mean, it's Italy and we've appreciated the laid back, but very competent vibe of the country. We aren't flying out until the next day, so we aren't in any rush. But we can just tell that these guys are raising the blood pressure of the staff. Shouting, taking their masks down to shout, not wearing their masks properly in a COVID testing area, and just generally being difficult where if they'd settled down, I think things would have moved along faster. It was clear they had left their testing to the last minute and were in danger of missing their flight. But, hey, your lack of planning doesn't constitute a crisis for the staff, now does it? It's kind of difficult to put into words what these guys were doing. They weren't speaking English, but they weren't speaking Italian to each other. I'm not totally sure where they were from, but they were just exuding loud, obnoxious, demanding, self-important masculinity to a mostly female staff. So they finally check in, and they take their tickets, and they move en masse to the testing area, and are loud and obnoxious and demanding there too. Here's where the petty revenge came in. 
the doctor running the facility was doing intake. Maybe they were all doctors, I don't know, but she was, which I found out at the end because she signed the form which required a doctor's signature. Anyway, she made sure this gang of 15 guys got trickled in through testing, two at a time. My girlfriend and I made sure to be polite, and I speak a tiny bit of Italian, so I made sure to greet the staff and ask sympathetically how it was going. And lo and behold, we get seen right away, and got our test results right away as this group of loud obnoxious guys had to wait. There was nothing outright rude about the way the staff handled it, but I could tell the vibe was very much, you're making our lives harder with your attitude, fine. We will not be rushing to help you make your flight. I almost lost it when my ticket, 385, was called, and one of the guys came up and tried to claim my results with ticket 382. I could see three tests completed at the station. So I'm positive the doctor could have helped him if he and his group had been pleasant and I wouldn't have minded. We'd explained our flight was the next day during check-in, but the doctor explained firmly that he had the wrong ticket number and sent him back to wait. Then they gave me my results. Then my girlfriend's results, we'd checked in together. She had ticket 384. We thanked her and moseyed back to the hotel for some drinks as some of the group that had come in front of us was still there waiting to be served. I don't know if they made their flight or not, and I won't claim the medical staff wanted them to miss their flight, but they didn't not want them to miss their flight either. And it was all done so smoothly, I'm not sure the guys even realized the staff had taken their petty revenge on them. But if any of you Daughtery and the Roma Aeroporto read this, well done. I hope the rest of your day went better. Needless to say, stuff like this is definitely an inspiration as to why I try to treat all these people who work retail type jobs with respect. Even if I'm like really stressed out or under pressure, I'm not going to act out and lash out at these people who have nothing to do with the real situation and only stand to make it worse if I do act out like that. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.